producing a report that simply talks about things you might want to happen doesn't this, without reflecting on what is there isn't actually a very good idea. Thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10033 in the name of Fiona Hislop on time to shine youth arts strategy. I'd invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And when you are ready, Cabinet Secretary, uh, I will call on you, Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop, to speak to and move the motion. 14 minutes, please. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to open this debate on Time to Shine, uh, Scotland's first ever uh, youth art strategy. And let me begin by saying I strongly believe that music, dance, art, literature and theatre are all keys that unlock profound human understanding and accomplishment in our young people. They offer them an opportunity to see life with a larger perspective and through a different lens. Yet even more importantly, the creative arts are the measure and reflection of our nation. The moral values we treasure are reflected in the beauty and truth that is emotionally transmitted through the arts. The harshness and sometimes cruelty of life can also be expressed. The arts say something about ourselves to future generations, about what kind of nation we have been and wish to be in the future. In November 2013, uh, we launched Time to Shine, uh, Scotland's first ever youth art strategy, a comprehensive yet practical strategy centred around the three key themes of one, creating and sustaining engagement, two, nurturing potential and talent, and three, developing the infrastructure and support. Developed for young people, it was heavily influenced by young people and their experiences and wishes too. This strategy reinforces the wider benefits and positive impacts of culture to the development of our young people and their communities. It makes explicit the already well-established links between culture, education, youth employment and personal development. It not only provided uh, enhanced access opportunities for all of Scotland's young people, but it will also create career pathways for Scotland's talent of the future be it on stage, the screen, behind the scenes, or in our world-leading creative industries. Most importantly of all, this engagement with culture will nurture personal qualities that will help our young people to grow confidently as citizens and towards realising their ambitions, wherever they may lie. And this strategy builds upon the strong foundation of a vibrant and forward-thinking youth arts sector, which is already the envy of much of Europe. We are quite exceptional in having a range of national youth arts companies for theatre, music and dance and, are, and uh, benefit from many energetic and visionary stakeholders such as Systema Scotland and Fashion and Gale. Curriculum for Excellence uh, recognises that the expressive arts provide opportunities to underpin and enrich learning in all other curriculum areas. Indeed, many young people learn their own traditional music, dance and stories within the curriculum or through other more informal projects. Creative Scotland, our national agency for the arts, screen and creative industries, are not taking this forward in isolation. And Time to Shine builds upon and draws alongside two already exceptionally successful youth arts programmes. Cashback for Creativity is part of the Scottish Government's Cashback for Communities programme, which reinvests the proceeds of crime back into communities to benefit Scotland's young people. In the last three years, this programme has invested £2.25 million to provide opportunities to participate in arts activities for young people that would not normally have access to them. And I saw an excellent example of this at Howden Park uh, Centre in Livingston recently. Uh, young people showcasing a film that they had made. This was an A to Z of Broxburn, detailing, detailing de de things that they like about the town, things that they like to do, things they don't like and would like to change and some of their aspirations. Uh, it was a wonderful illustration of the power of film, particularly, but culture, to engage and inspire young people, to encourage them to look beyond their boundaries, to raise their expectations and their ambitions. Creative Scotland have also recently announced the launch of the Youth uh, Music Initiative's 2014 programme. Uh, I have once again prioritised and maintained the funding for this important initiative, with the overall fund of £10 million for this coming year supporting Scotland's children, fostering and developing their musical skills and unlocking their creative potential. The broader youth arts sector is also doing much to engage with and develop young people. 
Starting this month, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra will provide a comprehensive orchestra-led music access programme to primary and secondary schools across Scotland. In, in terms of scale and choice, RSNO Engage for Schools is the first of its kind in the UK. And of course, another exciting project is Systema Scotland's Big Noise Orchestra, whose projects in Raplock and now in Govan Hill continue to be a success. Indeed, the Chamber will remember and recall Maestro Abruz, uh, the founder of the El Sistema movement in Venezuela, uh, when he came to Scotland and his invitation to Big Noise to visit Venezuela during his visit to Raplock with the Simon Bolivar Symphony Orchestra when he came for the big concert in 2012. So following this, 52 children visited Caracas in January 2014, where they studied alongside their Venezuelan contemporaries and performed a live concert in one of the city's foremost concert halls. And there was an excellent BBC documentary about that visit shown very recently. Of course, we mustn't forget our wonderful national youth performing companies and the National Youth Choir of Scotland enjoyed another strong season and this Saturday uh, will be taking part in the Going for Gold concert at the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall. And this will be a wonderful music celebration um, of inspiration, ambition and talent ahead of Glasgow 2014. The National Youth Orchestra of Scotland enjoyed another very successful summer tour. They were joined this time by the distinguished conductor Christopher Seaman and the brilliant award-winning violinist Alina Pogoskina. And I'm sure that they not only brought great joy to their audiences, but also have developed themselves as musicians by working with such world-class talents. And of course, the National Youth Jazz Orchestra have also gone from strength to strength with their storming performances at the London Jazz Festival in November and a sophisticated interpretation of the work of Miles Davis at the Aberdeen Jazz Festival this March. Presiding officer, we want every young person to benefit from and be enriched by culture. And this is why we conducted a national discussion on the youth arts and the expertise, knowledge and the sheer passion of the nearly 2,000 stakeholders that contributed were critical in shaping Time to Shine. These views were varied and there were areas of contention, yet there was also a very clear consensus across all of those that we consulted. The young people, supporters, artists, organisers, deliverers and funders. That to become an international leader in youth arts, we must put young people at the very heart of what we do. So this is exactly what Time to Shine seeks to achieve by removing the barriers, be they physical, social or economic, which prevent young people growing, developing and realising their potential through the arts as creators, as professionals or as young enthusiasts. And I'm pleased to note the progress that Time to Shine has made in the short time since its launch last November. Last month saw the announcement of £3.1 million funding for a network of regional youth arts hubs across the country, delivering a, a manifesto commitment. This is part of the £5 million funding awarded to Creative Scotland from the Scottish Government's Young Scots Fund and will, over the next two years, support initiatives based on key objectives of Time to Shine. The hubs in... Yes, indeed. In MacArthur. Um, she's quite rightly drawn attention to um, Big Noise Raplock and, and, and Govan Hill, uh, but she'll recall the Education and Culture Committee took evidence from Creative Scotland a while back now uh, where I think they, they conceded that there were difficulties in expanding the access to the broad range of, of arts and culture uh, beyond those who are, already have uh, interactions with it. Are, are, are there anything that she can point to that perhaps um, suggests that new initiatives might make more progress than we've um, actually been able to make to date? Yes, indeed, and I think one of the things about the youth arts hubs is that it's going to be a, a, an issue that's also driven by young people because there is something about peer-to-peer -peer encouragement. We can incentivise and encourage young people and we can have, as I've recalled, a lot of our national companies going into schools, etc. But actually the enthusiasm of young people working with each other uh, will actually make it easier to build some of those bridges to some of the communities that perhaps otherwise might not have experienced arts. But perhaps there's more going on than probably most of us in this chamber necessarily necessarily realise uh, we might not descri describe it as such as arts and culture and I look forward to hearing what Patricia Ferguson says in her contribution because there's a deep range that's there already we just have to make sure um, that we provide that energy commitment and indeed resource to help connect and I'll come on to some of these ideas of how we connect better um, in my later remarks. 
Uh, to, returning uh, to the focal point that the Reach Art Youth Arts Delivery the Hubs will, will, will have, they, they are intended to nurture and celebrate ambition, enthusiasm and talent and to improve the regional infrastructure. Young people will be central to the decision-making process and development of the Youth Arts Hubs. And as I've said, this strategy builds upon an already strong and flourishing sector and Creative Scotland, in looking at the hubs, were faced with many difficult decisions to make. Uh, such was the interest in these new art, arts, uh, youth arts hubs, not all applications could be accepted and I'm aware that Creative Scotland have plans for a regional intervention fund to be used to address geographical gaps in the national coverage of the hub funding such as the south of Scotland and the Western Isles. I know that Creative Scotland will continue to engage with all these partners in the future. Indeed, uh, the quality of these bids mean, means that many will come back as mainstream applications to Creative Scotland in due course. So the youth arts hubs are most definitely to enhance what is already there and fill gaps in provision create great connect connectivity and build a voice for youth arts. Hopefully they will also grow the appetite for enhanced provision. And central to delivering this strategy is the understanding that not only do young people have to be at the centre of this process, but we also must adapt to the new and different ways that they live their lives. Young people today communicate and express themselves in ways that I'm sure uh, are perhaps beyond the ken of a, a new few members of, of this chamber. We have to be attuned to what social media they will use and how they are shaping the internet to their own means and values in the cultural area. And that's why I'm pleased that this strategy places such a strong emphasis on using new and emerging technologies to create virtual as well as physical uh, ways to connect young people to projects, activities, events and initiatives to inspire and to invigorate. Um, I'm pleased that the strategy is moving so quickly. I've noted the £3.5 million pounds the Youth Arts Development Fund is already exploring new and innovative models of youth arts provision across a range of art forms. In Edinburgh and Lothians, the Creative Mix Youth Hive Hub will develop creative apprenticeships, traineeships and work experience opportunities for young people alongside a hive of networked and staged multi-arts activities. Uh, meanwhile, Fesh Ross will work together with partners to deliver the Highland Youth Arts Hub, which will include the development of a new art, youth arts strategy specifically for the Highlands. Uh, Creative Scotland have also appointed a youth arts programme manager who will manage the creation of the youth arts programme management team and that will coordinate the implementation programme of Time to Shine over the two-year scope of the Youth Arts Hub development. And, Presiding Officer, I'm pleased to uh, be able to announce today that Creative Scotland are also working in partnership with Young Scott to establish a National Youth Arts Advisory Group made up of young volunteers aged 14 to 21. Young Scott is recruiting and will support a core group of 15 young people from across Scotland from a variety of socio-economic backgrounds and representing the core youth art forms in Time to Shine. They will meet for the first time in August this year. And these young people will be provided with a training programme to develop and enhance their leadership skills and they will work uh, with Creative Scotland to advise on the implementation and development of Time to Shine and provide a direct peer-to-peer -peer link with the regional youth engagement initiatives being led by the Youth Hearts Hubs. As I've mentioned before, our youth arts sector is already the envy of much of Europe. However, I'm happy to say that there has already been further international interest around Time to Shine. Indeed, just last December, I met with the Danish Culture Ministry, who were very impressed by Time to Shine, and in particular by the innovative and ambitious way that we're communicating it, including our well-received graphic novel. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government believes that our culture is of us all and for us all, that we should all have the opportunity and the enthusiasm to participate in art and in culture. It is our duty to encourage our young people and our children to learn a love, a curiosity, a value for culture, regardless of their class, background or where they live. And we know that immersion in cultural activity can help bolster the resilience and well-being of communities and individuals. And nowhere is this more important than in our children and young people in our future. And this is an investment that we're only happy and pleased to make. A nation that treats the arts as the province of a few gifted children or views them only as recreation and entertainment is a nation that doesn't care for its future. Culture is a nation's most precious heritage, for it is in our works of art that we reveal to ourselves and to others the inner vision which guides us as a nation. And I firmly believe that it is better for political parties to reach a consensus when it comes to the future of our young people. I look forward to hearing your views uh, across the chamber on this issue, on this, the most important of issues, and I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. 
I now call on Patricia Ferguson to speak to and move Amendment 10033.1. Ten minutes earlier by, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And for the avoidance of doubt, I move the amendment in my name. And firstly, let me say that I very much welcome Time to Shine, Scotland's Youth Art Strategy. It's been quite a long time in gestation, but it is welcome nevertheless. I believe that the strategy is a good one, but I do wonder if it goes far enough or if it adequately reflects the ambition and dynamism that Scotland's young people so often demonstrate and which the young contributors to the consultation clearly exhibited. But I'll come back to that. Let me firstly look at where we are and the support that exists to encourage young people to start out on a lifelong journey with the arts. As we know, children born in Scotland in the last 12 years or so are likely to have been supplied with a book bug bag. I always find that one slightly challenging, I have to say. Um, which aims to encourage their parents to begin their interest in words and pictures and in the sound of the spoken word at a very early age. They should also have had the opportunity to try out a musical instrument while they were at primary school to begin to nurture a lifelong interest in music and hopefully to encourage them to be active listeners or, where they have talent or interest, active participants in the performance of music or perhaps even in producing it. Equally, they may have enjoyed dra dance or drama as part of their active schools experience and find that this is something they wish to pursue. And for many years, those young people with a particular interest or talent have had the opportunity to play or perform with the National Youth Choir of Scotland, the National Youth Orchestras of Scotland, Y Dance, the Scottish Youth Theatre or the National Youth Pipe Band of Scotland. And those organisations, many of whose performances I have had great delight from, have helped to develop talent in those particular mediums. And we are in Scotland fortunate to have so many dedicated organisations that can help to nurture that talent and ensure that young people who have access to them can develop their ability. The national performing companies also do excellent work going into schools and developing a love of music or drama in the young people they work with. And anyone who has witnessed the performances that result cannot fail to admire the dedication of the professionals involved or the sheer joy of the pupils who participate. Ultimately, of course, we also have the Conservatoire, which helps to hone the skills of those whose talents will lead them to the performing arts. Seats of learning like the Conservatoire build the confidence of their students by exposing them to opportunities which will help to develop further their talent and, of course, offer them the best possible education in their chosen field. And perhaps uniquely, we have Fish in the Gale and Sistema. Fish in the Gale nurturing and promoting our native instruments, music and language and helping to ensure their continued relevance. And as the Cabinet Secretary has rightly identified, the work being done in Raploch and now in Govan Hill by Sistema is also excellent and reaches young people who might not otherwise have the opportunity to enjoy and be involved in the making of high quality music. And as the Cabinet Secretary knows, I would dearly love to see Sistema or the Big Noise Orchestra rolled out across other communities in Scotland, beginning, of course, with my own, an aspiration I'm sure many of us share, such as our admiration for the project. But as Liz Smith, uh, sorry, as Liam MacArthur rightly pointed out, that might not be something that is practical to do. And um, I think we have to consider how we give other young people those kinds of important opportunities. But what the strategy barely mentions is the work being done by Scotland's colleges and universities. Many local colleges are working in music and drama and in the practical subjects that support performance, like sound engineering, to name but one. Although as college places have been cut in recent years, many of the courses specialising in the arts have unfortunately suffered. And similarly, the colleges and universities that support students of the visual arts don't seem to rate much of a mention in the strategy either, despite the fact that many of our Scottish institutions have such internationally renowned reputations. So it seems to me that we're missing an opportunity to encourage these institutions to both collaborate one with another and to ensure that they all contribute to this agenda. And local arts organisations like Toonspeak Young People's Theatre do marvellous work in Glasgow, often with young people for whom going to the theatre will not be a regular occurrence. But they still produce marvellous, inspiring, challenging, sometimes wacky, but always interesting performances, 
with some of the most enthusiastic and talented actors taking part, many of whom had no idea until a few short weeks before that they had an interest, never mind a talent, in that direction. And so too, Depot Arts in my own constituency, which provides a safe space for young people to meet and to create. But it does it in such a way that I'm sure that most of the young people involved don't immediately think of it as an arts organisation. It is simply somewhere they enjoy going to and where they will be sure of a warm welcome and the opportunity to do something that is both interesting and fun. At its heart, however, Depot Arts is an arts organisation, but it is a community arts organisation, firmly rooted in that community and very aware of what its audience needs and how best that should be delivered. It sometimes looks on the surface as though it's easy to do, but actually it takes great skill to pull it together and to make it a success. Presiding officer, a recent meeting I had with Depot Arts was very interesting. They told me that they hoped to provide a forum where the issues about the referendum could be discussed in the form of a rap battle. I think that they took one look at me and thought that I believed that this was a crazy, dreadful idea, and frankly, I did. Until I realised that they didn't actually expect me to participate, <laughs> or at least I don't think they do. But my point is, presiding officer, that organisations such as this are also part of the educational offer that should be available to our young people and can sometimes approach issues in ways that the rest of us and the other institutions in Scotland will miss out on, not because they're negligent or deficient in any way at all, but just because not everyone fits into a particular mould. And that, to me, is the joy and the wonder of organisations such as Depot Arts and Toonspeak. And there are many others like them up and down the country. And they must be part of our strategy going forward. They have a unique insight into the lives of many of our young people, and particularly those young people whose opportunity to enjoy the arts would otherwise be extremely limited indeed. And they do a wonderful job in performing in the way that they do. And my point is, presiding officer, that our national youth performing arts companies are absolutely excellent organisations but they're not the only ones working with young people. And we have to ensure that this strategy is as inclusive as possible if it is going to work. And I think actually that the performing companies would agree with me. They recognise that talent and interest must be nurtured and that all young people should be involved. And the strategy document itself makes the point that gender, race or circumstances should not prevent you from having opportunity. But unfortunately, for too many of our young people, those circumstances of gender or race or of the many other issues that beset our country do prevent young people from having their fair share of what is available to their peers. Now, Scottish Labour firmly believes in the concept of art for art's sake, but we also recognise that exposure to and immersion in the arts can help to ensure good mental and physical health, for example, it can break down barriers amongst groups of young people and it can help our schools and colleges to be the exciting and dynamic places we would all want them to be. For some young people, their involvement in the arts will be a lifelong opportunity for en enjoyment and challenge. And for those with a talent or a skill, it may also be a career. And we should look to see how we can encourage artists and performers to mentor young people with an interest in the arts to allow them to achieve their full potential. This morning, the Cabinet Secretary and I took part in a Q&A about independence with the publishing industry. And I would just say to the Cabinet Secretary, I was already planning to say that in my speech before one of the contributions from the floor today, which questioned whether we were doing enough to encourage young people to look toward a career in the creative industries. And I think that questioner had a very valid point. And I wonder too whether it isn't possible to look to provide more apprenticeships in the arts. I know that there are currently 22 across Scotland, but given how vibrant our arts sectors are, surely we could do better than that, particularly given that we have identified the creative industries as being so important mm -hmm. to our national economy. Presiding officer, I think anyone who knows me will know that I firmly believe in the arts as a force for good in Scotland in so many areas. I very much welcome this strategy as a contribution to that effort, 
but I would like to see us being a little bit more ambitious. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Liz Smith. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can uh, we thoroughly agree with uh, the Cabinet Secretary when she says that this is uh, a seminal moment in terms of uh, the arts for young people? We fully support the time to shine and the accompanying investment that the Scottish Government has made, plus the Young Scot initiative that the Cabinet Secretary uh, announced this afternoon. Uh, could we therefore support the motion and also the amendment uh, in the name of Patricia Ferguson? I think over many years Scotland has been renowned for its arts and culture and uh, notwithstanding some important uh, questions that I think the Cabinet Secretary is aware I have some concerns about the strategic direction of one or two of our senior arts bodies at present, it's very encouraging to see the progress that is being made to regard, with regard to the youth bodies. Uh, we already have a very impressive youth arts structure, uh, encompassing bodies such as the National Youth Choir of Scotland, and I heard them recently in the Usher Hall, and uh, I think they are on a par, probably better actually, than many of their uh, senior counterparts, not just in Scotland but across the world, absolutely ph phenomenal. Um, but things like the Scottish Youth Theatre, the National Youth Orchestras of Scotland, the Scottish Youth Dance and of course the Conservatoire as well, they all facilitate young people's engagement with the arts on a, a very professional basis. Uh, although I think Patricia Ferguson makes a very good point when she says that the whole responsibility must not just fall on these bodies but also on local arts bodies on schools and she made a good point about uh, colleges and universities and I think uh, particularly in fact the cabinet secretary uh, mentioned this too that in terms of the imagination and the creativity and the type of communication that these young people have is not necessarily uh, for uh, other generations and I think we have to listen carefully to what they're saying. Now that said I think the strategic review offers uh, the opportunity to plan for the longer term and to ensure that children and young people from all backgrounds have the opportunity to express themselves artistically and engage with Scotland's rich cultural heritage. I note that participation, progression and provision are Time to Shine's three main themes and they are all laudable. Uh, I can't help feeling that the order is perhaps just a little jumbled. I think uh, increased participation would follow better from improved provision. Other ones, uh, otherwise, I think we run the risk of trying to broaden engagement without first widening uh, the facilities that we have. So I hope the nine youth arts hubs that um, I understand will span the length of Scotland from uh, the Highlands down to uh, Ayrshire in the southwest will be created just as soon as uh, possible and that they will provide youngsters with a platform to explore a whole range of arts with a clearly articulated national and regional policy because I think that's a, a crucial uh, point. While the rich uh, diversity of Scotland's uh, cultural landscape is very much to be cherished and celebrated, I think it's fair to say that in terms of raw opportunities, those living in Edinburgh, Glasgow and the surrounding areas have often had uh, access to a much broader range of cultural organisations and performances. And while there's much to celebrate in that, we must do everything that we can to ensure that the arts in its broadest sense of the term uh, do not become the preserve of our major cities, but instead have a very strong presence right across the country. And that's difficult uh, because obviously there are economies of scale uh, in the high concentration in the cities has led to some very noticeable uh, successes. I think uh, we all take immense pride when the shortlist for this year's uh, Turner Prize was announced uh, just uh, a few weeks ago that uh, three of the four nominees uh, had actually studied at the Glasgow School of Art. That's an outstanding uh, achievement made all the more remarkable by the fact that it just cements Glasgow's reputation as the preeminent uh, centre for the visual arts in the UK. During the last uh, decade, three Turner Prize recipients, Simon Starling, Richard Wright and Martin Boyce, have all been uh, part of the uh, Glasgow School of Art alumni, and two more, Martin Creed and Susan Phillips, were brought up in the city, something I notice has not been lost on the organiser, organisers of the Commonwealth Games uh, Culture Programme. But the broader point, of course, is that academic research consistently reveals that there is a very strong link between exposure to the arts and participation uh, with them in the longer run. Published in 2010, Starting Young Links Between uh, Childhood and Adult Participation in Culture and Science was a Scottish Government Commission literature uh, review into how early exposure was connected to long-term participation in cultural and scientific activities. Several reports, including the Taking Part survey commissioned by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, found a very strong link between childhood involvement in the arts and participation as an adult. Oh, of course. 
Cabinet Secretary. I'm very pleased that the member has uh, cited that research. And of course, the key thing is about participation. It's not just being an audience member when you're young, it's actually participating, which means we have to have a far more hands on, participative approach to our youth art strategy. Liz Smith. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. I think she's absolutely right. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was uh, the findings of some Dutch research as well that was done uh, on this issue. Uh, but it suggests that in order to meet one of uh, Time to Shine's key aims, which is addressing the uh, cultural inequalities, the focus needs to be uh, just as much on parents and on the families as it is on the children. Uh, last night in uh, this parliament, we heard very strong evidence about the success of young people in sport. If there was a commitment between them and the whole family to a particular activity, in this case it was swimming, uh, and most especially within our most deprived communities. And given the outstanding success of uh, Systema Scotland, which uh, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, obviously spoken about already, I think that is perhaps one of the biggest lessons that we can learn for the overall uh, strategy. So while there are merits in uh, innovations, such as the proposed Youth Arts Ambassador Scheme as a tool to encourage broader participation in the arts, encouraging uh, peer engagement, I think uh, we need to add on that family dimension because it certainly gives youngsters uh, a confidence uh, on that. To suggest that in order to address the cultural inequalities, the appeal of the arts has to broaden uh, is something that's not just about families, but I think it's about the whole community aspect as well. And one of the things that I've been most encouraged about recently, particularly actually in the, in the non-city areas of Scotland, is that community engagement. And I think it's all about Scotland's civic uh, well-being. And that was something that uh, was brought up at the Education Committee, I think it was about 22nd uh, of April when Richard Holloway uh, spoke, um, I, I thought, very meaningfully about our civic well-being and about the intrinsic value uh, of the arts, which I know the Cabinet Secretary uh, has uh, mentioned in several key speeches, and, and trying to balance that when obviously there are uh, potential economic uh, benefits. So to sum up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, we fully support the stated uh, goals of Time to Shine, and particularly when it comes to its broadening engagement. It's very important that the youth arts are not treated in isolation but are part of a much uh, bigger national uh, strategy. Uh, we're very happy to support both the motion and the amendment. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. I can give members up to seven minutes. Christian Allard to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, we celebrated the value of our fantastic youth workers improving young people's life chances across Scotland. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking on the arts strategy supporting Scotland's children and young people to flourish through culture and creativity. In recognising the positive impact that arts and creativity can have, this government is working in collaboration with many in order to achieve the aims of the youth arts strategy. The Cabinet Secretary spoke about the network of regional youth heart hubs across the country. This collaborative approach works through partnerships between local and national hearts and youth services providers. Because access to youth hearts for all, all across the many communities of Scotland, the one remote ones, the rural and urban communities, is vital for our young people. There is a lot happening at national level. We punch well above our weight in arts, culture and creativity. The decision of the National Theatre of Scotland to have no stage of its own has created that spirit of, of freedom space to redefine what national theatre uh, can be about. Uh, Scotland is a stage for the National Theatre, and that uh, puts the barriers down uh, for some more creative thinking of how we can uh, de de develop the arts in Scotland. Like many in this chamber, I drag my children to see the play seen by tens of thousands of people across three continents. A play with 22 awards, including four Lawrence Olivier Awards, Best Director, Best Theatre Choreography, Best Play and Best Sounds Design. The National Theatre Scotland won its first US award with the New York uh, drama circle named Black Watch Best Foreign Play. At last year's Festival of Politics here in Parliament, I saw the Scottish Youth Theatre perform Now the Hour, and I know some of the members here present uh, went to that representation, and we were very, very touched by it and surprised uh, by, by, by its quality, uh, the quality of delivery and the, the creativity, the, the imagination uh, that the young people had. 
if you had this plan on that particular day. Presiding officers, the past few years, I participated to many debates to inform the people of Scotland about the decision uh, they will make on the 18th of September this year, but none of those debates were as insp inspirational or informative as the play now the hours creating by our young people. The Time to Shine Youth Heart Strategy, I recognize the fantastic uh, input of our young people, the input they are doing today, and is building on this. Just like uh, the National Theatre of Scotland, the Scottish Youth Theatre is working with local government and other parties to ensure that participation, creativity, talent development, and cultural expression are developed now and in the future and all across Scotland. The Scottish Youth Theatre is particularly best placed to work on curriculum for excellence, as the company's ethos is focused on creating confident individuals, successful learners, effective contributors, and responsible citizens. And of course, uh, many of young people, and some of them are here today, uh, will have the right to contribute as responsible citizens when voting in September. For people in the northeast, the region I represent, the Scottish Youth Theatre is also holding weekly classes at His Majesty's Theatre in Aberdeen. The sessions are open to anyone, regardless of previous experience, and are a fantastic way to build self-confidence. Self-confidence, creativity, and partnership are qualities that our young people need, whatever they will be involved in the arts or not in their working life thereafter. Particularly marginalized young people, children from diverse cultural backgrounds, like myself and my children, those young people uh, will use the new Youth Heart Hub for Aberdeen and the Northeast. Uh, I particularly agree with Ben Torrey, the Director of Programming of Creative Projects, Aberdeen Performing Arts, when he said that this new hub will harness the energy and creative potential of young people in the region through an inclusive, innovative and engaging program of youth hearts activity, which is shaped and driven by the participant. participant and that's very important. It has to be shaped and driven by the young people. Another local partner is the Northeast Hub, presiding officer, is a station house media unit, uh, or like we call it in the Northeast, SHMU. Uh, this charity established in 2003 is one of the core cultural organizations in Aberdeen, and it's at the forefront of community media development in Scotland, supporting residents in the seven regeneration areas of the city in radio and video production, traditional and online publications, music production, and digital inclusion. The organization supports marginalized young people with an employability and training arm. They run positive transitions and employability course open to 16, 19 to, six, to 19 years old from Aberdeen City who are not in education, employment or training. And this course runs for 12 weeks. I've been twice to listen to young people who went through this course, presenting officer. They made their family very proud, providing that arts, culture, and creativity can change our young people's lives for the better. There's a lot of good work to build on and to recognize the importance of collaboration, working with local government and the third sector to ensure that participation, creativity, talent development, and cultural expression are developed now and in the future. This government is putting young people of Scotland at the heart of Scotland's creative future. And I can give many more examples, President Your Officer, but I will have no time to, to do so. But I maybe speak about the Wooden Bandit Bankery, who have a creative uh, learning program which offers opportunities for develop across a broad range of social groups with events ranging from filmmaking workshops for young people and art and crafts workshop. These are very, very important. They are community-based and they respond very, very well to uh, the needs of our young people in rural areas. And I'm, I've got to say, I'm quite pleased to use the facility very often, not to participate, unfortunately, but uh, to be seen, to, to see what the young people are providing in our rural areas. But of course, uh, Scotland has as well a global reach, and we want our young people to learn from other cultures and to perform across the world. At the Albanese Beach Ballroom in March this year, I was invited by Aberdeen Councillor Jim Kiddy to the fundraising dinner held by Friends of Aberdeen International Youth Festival. A festival that has been running for over 40 years, another partner of the New Youth Hearts Hub. The money raised went to support not only young artists, but across the Northeast. We're also developing regions such as Africa, Asia, and South Africa. 
Time to shine is cut on first ever youth art strategy and other proof that this government believes that public funding of the art is fundamentally good. Many thanks. And I now call Jane Baxter to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's, it's better. Um, I want to thank the Scottish Government for bringing forward this debate on the Time to Shine strategy. For generations, the arts have been, alongside education, the great equaliser that has allowed people to prosper on merit and on talent rather than by their background. And the benefits go beyond making a career in the arts. Taking part in an artistic pursuit allows a young person to grow and to develop skills, the, so the soft skills we talk about so much that stand them in good stead for later life. I note that the substantive recommendations of the report total only two pages, and I look forward to hearing more about the detail as we go forward. For contrast, the Northern Irish equivalent, the Arts Council of Northern Ireland Youth Arts Strategy 2013-17, totals over 30,000 words, including eight pages of examination of our system here in Scotland. This is a, an analysis of the Northern Irish cultural situation in comparative perspective, and it's perhaps something that we could have pursued further. And while I welcome many of the aspects of the strategy in my speech, I do wish the government had provided more information of how the initiatives will take place over the two years and especially how the goals will interact with the Curriculum for Excellence. In Fife, a participative approach is being taken to developing the arts. Listening to feedback from children, the Council has recently approved a match funding agreement working alongside voluntary organisations and charitable trusts to further the work of the groundbreaking Alhambra Theatre in Dunfermline. They now employ a dedicated youth development officer, doubling the capacity of their annual summer stage school and maintaining regular drama classes, which will support 180 young people every week. Their focus is entirely on promoting confidence, teamwork, equality and social skills among young people. And crucially, their classes are entirely flexible to fit in with the varying ways of life of different young people across Fife. This is a perfect example of how the arts should be supported by government. We should be working in partnership with organisations already rooted in our communities, rather than a top-down approach with rigid guidelines. So I'm glad that the Scottish Government's Time to Shine strategy reflects my concerns in this area and gives a lot of leeway to groups to shape their own strategy. I also want to talk a little about the value of musical tuition. My own area, Fife, has a long-standing tradition of supporting youth orchestras and groups, and I hope that the proposed National Youth Arts Consortium will offer a way of sharing this, this expertise to other areas. One of my proudest moments as a councillor was when I was present for a performance by the Kelty and Blair Adam Pipe Band at the Highland Games in Pitt Lockery. It was through tailored support from Fife Council that these young people were able to get the tuition and the mentoring which enabled them to perform on a national stage. And I'm therefore glad to see that local authorities will be key partners of the Youth Arts Hub as the experience and knowledge they can provide is truly valuable. Recently, I've also learned of the work of pioneering organisations like Create It Cloud, which is based in Dunfermline, and which does excellent work in supporting young people's involvement in new creative industries like film production. As this demonstrates, culture is no longer something static, but something that is inherently interactive, and I will closely follow the government's exploration of how technology can be used to further engagement with the arts. I note the aim to set up a national digital platform and again look forward to seeing the detail on the exact role this will play in furthering the cultural offering for young people in Scotland. I'm also glad to see that national bodies like Theatre Workshop Scotland will be included as partners of the youth arts hubs across the country. Theatre Workshop Scotland produced the excellent Happy Lands film in Fife with support from Creative Scotland through the National Lottery, funding from Fife Council and in association with BBC Scotland. I visited the set of the film and was struck by the range of skills and experience which local people of all ages were having the chance to experience. As well as performance skills, local people were involved in technical production skills, set building, makeup and costumes. It was a great experience for everyone who took part and of course they produced a film that went on to be successful on a world stage. The skeletal proposals to establish an arts award scheme and a national mentoring programme are to be welcomed, and I'm sure members across the chamber will join with me in supporting Scottish Government's proposals that they should have a social mobility and equality at their core. 
I hope that the Scottish Government ensures that these programmes work together to properly concentrate support where it will provide the most benefit. I also call on the Government to ensure that any roles created through the new, the new Youth Employment Initiative are paid roles to make sure that they are available to all. I'm sure I have the support of many members in making a call on the Government to have social good in mind when putting some meat on the bones of these proposals. Yet beyond this, there is really one point about this entire strategy that's been troubling me, and it's something I'd like the Minister to address when she concludes, or in writing later. At various points of the strategy, the Minister has identified that one of the priorities of the Time to Shine report was to enable participation in the arts to lead through to professional careers, and I wholeheartedly support her in this. But is it not true that the way that many people get involved in the arts is through college courses? And does it not strike the Minister as a little odd to have this as a priority, but at the same time to be chipping away at some of the chances individuals have to turn their love of creative arts into a career? I'd appreciate if the Minister could clarify whether she sees any contradiction here and work with us to ensure that there remains links from hobby to career through the further education sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move on with the debate, could I take this opportunity to remind members that they should be in the chamber for the majority of the debate, but at the very least for two speakers following their own speech. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the publication of the Youth Art Strategy, which has been highlighted as the Cabinet Secretary as the first ever publication of a strategy in Scotland. I believe it's a comprehensive and ambitious document which I believe matches our ambition for our young people in the arts. I'm sure that we all recognise that we already have a successful and thriving youth arts culture in Scotland. And perhaps the FESH movement is the best example of, of the work in Scotland already being done. But this strategy takes us far further. It recognises the social and economic and health benefits of the arts which can be life-changing for our young people. If I may, presiding officer, I want to concentrate on Scotland's future. So you'll not be surprised if I turn to the how we'll get there section of the strategy. There are seven principles in the strategy and I may not be able to speak to all of them today, but um, I do think that they set out very well how we take this forward. Um, principle number one says it places young people at the centre of the strategy the aims and ambitions, and it also at the centre of the plans to deliver the strategy. And I have to say, we have already demonstrated this principle in the development of the strategy itself. And I commend the work that Creative Scotland did in engaging with stakeholders in working on the strategy, inviting young people from across Scotland to contribute and engage in the developing, and doing an animated presentation of their contributions, which can be seen on the Creative Scotland website. So I have every confidence that this principle will bear fruit and that our young people will continue to be at the heart of how we take this, these policy priorities forward. Principle number two is about the work within the context of Curriculum for Excellence and other policy frameworks to support young people. And I think this is absolutely key. Curriculum for Excellence will be um, transformational in how we, we're delivering our education to young people. And I, I believe that keeping this principle and what we're doing at the heart of curriculum for excellence will, will be a, a great asset to Scotland's future. I have to disagree with Patricia Ferguson because in this principle it is actually detailed that further and higher education have a similarly important role in deepening and extending the skills and thinking of our young people. And it, um, far from not including um, our colleges and, and higher education establishments in, in the strategy, I think that this, this demonstrates that absolutely key to it. Yes, yeah, certainly. Patricia Ferguson. I think the point I made was that they didn't rate much of a mention. They're mentioned once, um, and that's not really developed and followed up. And really, that's all I was saying, that I'd like to see that be much more integrated into the strategy going forward. And I appreciate this is the strategy kicking off, if you like, but it does need to be developed, and all of these institutions need to be involved. Claire Adamson. I, Thank you, Patricia Ferguson, for, for um, intervening on that point and the clarification on that point. But I, I do think in, in such a... It, it's, it's, as well as being an ambitious and comprehensive document, I do think it has been quite concise. And the fact that they're mentioned there, I think, is, is, is very important. In 2012, um, I highlighted some of the um, curriculum work that's been done in North Lanarkshire Schools music groups. 
um, where, where the young people are given an opportunity to attend Coatbridge High School and where there's an incredible array of talent brought together. Um, the wind ensemble, chorus, symphony orchestra, junior and senior string bands, the jazz orchestra, wind band, prep band, pipe band and the traditional music group all to come together in the one place on a Friday evening and participate in, in um, developing their musical talents and they indeed get to showcase that at a performance at the end of the year. Principle number three um, talks about working collaboratively to create a mechanism for better information sharing, peer support and networking. I think this is extremely important. Um, young people, I think, um, perhaps embrace social media and, and the opportunities to share what they're doing far more than, than we do. And I, I think that to capture the good practice out there and let young people showcase to one another is very, very important. Principle number four is about being proactive, proactive in use of digital technology. And um, members will know that I have a keen interest in this area as a chair of the cross-party group on games technology. I'm always telling um, young people that I meet that if they're interested in technology and a BAFTA award, then the Scottish games industry is where they should be. Because, of course, this is a, an industry that supports musicians, voiceover um, um, participants, um, graphic designers and a whole array of, of creative talents um, and not the least of which story writers um, and script writers um, in that technology. And principle number five is about the work with the national and local government. And as pe people have mentioned already in the chamber today, this is absolutely key to how we go forward. We have to work within Scotland with all of our organisations and partners. And I think that some of the collaborative work that the Scottish Government has already demonstrated with the local government is very, very important. Um, I will mention a, a local charity um, that I, I became aware of as a, a North Lanarkshire councillor, Real Time Music from Newark Hill. Um, they're a, a music charity that aims to bring about a positive change in the lives of disenfranchised young people. And they will do everything through the provision of affordable recording and rehearsal services, workshop and training provision, volunteering and partnership projects. And they have found that providing an informal service, music is a great way to break down barriers, learn new skills, increase aspirations and develop a more active lifestyle. And they're an excellent example of that partnership working because their funding comes from Cashback, from North Lanarkshire Partnership, from North Lanarkshire Council itself, Scottish Government, Creative Scotland. Um, they work with Strathclyde Fire and Rescue, with YouthLink, with the um, mental health festivals and arts in the areas. And, and of course, they, they were very, very appreciative to, to get some additional funding for Creative Scotland for pr provision of instruments and recording uh, music. I don't have time to touch on the other principles, but if I could just finish with a quote from the Chair of Systema Scotland at our Education and Culture um, Committee this week. Um, principle six is about tackling inequalities, and I think this is probably the most important part of this whole strategy. He says, we could recognise all round that the total health of the nation is tied up with the arts. My experience of children's orchestras in Raplock and Govan Hill is that everything gets better with them. The children become more determined and studious, as well as happier and healthier. And I would hope that the new Scotland could somehow recognise that. And I think that sums up exactly where we want to be with taking this strategy forward. Thank you. Many thanks. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I too um, very much welcome the publication of Time to Shine with its themes of participation, progression and provision. If nothing else, it may have re rehabilitated the notion of PPP for some of us. Um, it, it also, I think, has stimulated a, a fairly constructive uh, a debate. And, and can I add my welcome to uh, to the announcement of the National Youth uh, Advisory Group. I think the, the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely right about the need in taking this strategy forward to make sure that the young people themselves are very much uh, at the heart of that. And I think Claire Adamson was also right um, to remind us that we are uh, moving forward from a position of, of relative strength uh, in many respects. I think we would all accept um, the wider benefits of, of a vibrant uh, cultural community, but uh, again, focusing today on the impact on the children and young people in the way that um, they can flourish 
uh, through culture and creativity. Uh, building self-confidence, building teamwork, communication skills, all, I think, um, uh, fairly faithful echoes of some of the uh, benefits we were hearing, as Christian Allard said, um, it, during the youth work and volunteering debate uh, last week. Uh, I, I think uh, Fiona Hislop, again, was absolutely right um, to, to sort of pray and aid as evidence of this uh, big noise and Rapalock's um, ability to transform lives uh, through music uh, in that community. Uh, and I think we've heard um, Richard Holloway's uh, remarks quoted by various members uh, so far. Uh, but I thought his evidence to the committee uh, a few weeks back was, was very telling. Not only did he point to the esteem, the confidence, pride and aspiration that the individuals themselves um, experienced, but actually the wider um, biosmosis effect uh, that this had on their families and in the wider community uh, was very telling uh, indeed. Uh, obviously, the, the approach here is, is one that lays heavy emphasis on, on collaboration. And again, uh, I, I, I think that is absolutely critical. The, the government's motion talks about the collaboration between Scottish government, national bodies, local government and others. But I think Patricia Ferguson is absolutely right in, in her amendment to uh, emphasise the role of local arts organisations. Uh, also, colleges and universities, uh, I think, in our interventions, uh, perhaps do uh, need to be uh, played up uh, a little further, uh, but also emphasising the, the, the crucial importance of widening in access and participation. I'm not sure whether um, Fiona Hislop and Patricia Ferguson engaging in a referendum wrap is the key to unlocking that, uh, but nevertheless, uh, all, all ideas welcome. Um, but I think also we need to um, recognise the, the role of major funding bodies in facilitating uh, this. The UK Big Lottery, for example, uh, I think has had a very important role to play, uh, not least in winding up Christine Graham with a number of parliamentary motions that are tabled. I will indeed. Sorry, Rob, Rob Gibson. I don't know whether you're coming to this or not, but I'd be interested to hear, since it's very soon uh, time for the Orkney Folk Festival, how young people are actually encouraged in those organisations. If the member could tell the rest of the chamber, I think that might be quite useful. Liam McCarthy. I think Rob Gibson makes an absolutely fair point. I should declare an interest as the brother of somebody who's heavily involved in organising the, the folk festival. But I think with, like all the festivals uh, in Orkney, which I think are a reflection of the, the, the cultural vibrancy within that community, uh, they've recognised if that is to continue over the long term, it absolutely needs to build in children and young people in, in pretty much everything uh, that it does. I, 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 as I say, I, I think Orkney is, is very well uh, served. I think it, it's an exemplar in terms of the collaborative approach, bringing together other national uh, local organisations, the diversity uh, of art forms, the commitment to access and participation and putting children and young people at the, at the centre of that. I think it very much um, it speaks to the quality of life uh, issues, enriching the lives of individuals and the, and the whole community. In, in many respects, actually helping to address the population decline uh, that was a real threat uh, not so very uh, long ago. It is a timely debate in that the, uh, the, the instrumental course is taking place in, in, in Orkney this week. And again, I declare an interest with two children uh, who are at that. But that brings together youngsters from across the county, uh, including the, the, the Outer Isles, receiving intensive uh, tuition from some of Orkney's phenomenal uh, music teachers who also support the Orkney Traditional Music Project, uh, and culminating in an exceptional concert at the end of the, the week, which I'm very much looking forward to attending. But I think uh, an aspect of that that probably bears um, uh, emphasising is uh, the commitment of the local council to free instrumental tuition, which is not the case across the country, but I think without which um, that sort of initiative just would struggle to survive in anything like its current form. Um, how does that represent itself in success? Well, I, clearly the young Arcadians attending the Conservatoire and the Plockton uh, School of Traditional Music, but, but that isn't necessarily the end uh, in itself. I think it's the exposure of children from all backgrounds in all parts of the county to the benefits of, of music and instrumental tuition uh, that I think is the real uh, sign of success of, of that initiative. It's not just the music, though. Uh, the Peer Arts Centre, which has, uh, is of international re renown, contributes very much to uh, the Scottish arts uh, uh, culture. It's, it's, uh, it's linked with the, the, the Tate Gallery. But again, its commitment to inspiring and involving children and young people through the Leading Light workshops. I attended Stromness Primary not so long ago where the, the, the children were all enthused uh, about an exhibition they were putting on in the Peer Arts Centre uh, under the banner Inspired By. I think very much shows the commitment there is uh, across the county uh, to, uh, to, to involvement of children and young people. 
community drama likewise. I don't think it's any accident um, that uh, the Palace Players uh, youth team have made the, the national youth finals of the One Act Play Festival, again showing uh, the strength of the arts across the, the piece in, in Orkney. And it's national bodies as well, I think, um, are showing a commitment um, to uh, the rural and, and, and remote areas. I think the Smith made a very valid point about making sure that this breaks beyond uh, the bigger city, but certainly my experience has been that the likes of Scottish Opera uh, are committed to, 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 to touring, to travelling, to engaging uh, with, uh, with schools and with young people uh, right across the country. NICOS similarly do tremendous work at a national level, and again I need to declare an interest as a son who's attended um, a couple of the, the residential courses, but they've been, um, I think, very assiduous in supporting efforts to establish uh, choirs right across the country, and I know um, the Orkney one is due to perform uh, next month uh, in, in Kirkwall. A reflection of all this, though, I think is in the festival scene that, that, that Orkney, um, uh, that or Orkney um, uh, can boast. The One Act Play Festival back in March, the Folk Festival later this month, uh, the uh, St Magnus Festival next month, um, later on in the year, the Blues Weekend and the Storytelling Festival, I think all um, speak of a very vibrant uh, cultural uh, scene, all focusing on ways in which you can involve and inspire a younger generation. The Wine Festival, uh, I think, is perhaps the obvious exception to that, that rule. Um, the St Magnus Festival, though, I, I, one of the most um, striking concerts I've been to in recent times uh, was from the BBC Symphony Orchestra, who, as well as going into the schools uh, through the course of the festival, actually performed uh, alongside uh, local musicians in a side-by-side -side concert, which uh, I think saw local musicians walk out of that concert hall 10 feet high, and, and an experience that you would struggle to see probably anywhere else, and, and possibly even in the major cities. Okay, uh, Josh, you to draw to a close, please. In conclusion, um, I couldn't be more supportive of the, the strategy, the collaborative approach, um, the, 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 it being led by young people, and the focus on access and participation. I need no persuading of the transformative effect that exposure to and involvement in music, art, drama, dance can have. I pay tribute to those who make it happen. They deserve and should get our unfaltering support. For it's their efforts that will allow our young people to get an opportunity and time to shine so that our civil well-being, as Richard Holloway said, is in the rudest of health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just remind members' speeches of up to seven minutes, please? Willie Coffey, to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I can congratulate my colleague from Orkney. And I remember some years ago I attended the Shopping Week Festival, and I can thoroughly re recommend it. So from Orkney to, to Kilmarnock, which members may be aware, of course, was the winner of the Creative Places Award last year, and everybody would be very welcome to make a return visit. Um, Presiding Officer, the emergence of the first national arts strategy for young people is a, a really important step for Scotland, is a huge an exciting opportunity for all of our young people. It sends out a message that here in Scotland we see the arts as a fundamental part of our society, just as important as any other of the many public investments that we might make. Whilst I wouldn't claim to be an expert by any means on the history of arts funding, my impression is that over the years the arts was always first to take a hit in any sector when budgets were tight. It was sometimes seen as an unnecessary luxury and was perhaps first for the job. So I'm very pleased to see not only the strategy emerging, but a £5 million tranche of funding to support it and to help Scotland become the international leader in youth arts. What I like about the strategy is that it seems to have a nice balance between setting some clear themes and principles, but also provides an extremely flexible canvas for creative talents to emerge and to find expression. You can tell from reading it that there were a huge number of ideas during the national discussion in 2012, and nearly a 1,000 young people contributed, to, contributed their vision to develop the strategy leading to its launch last November. I, I too would like to pick out a few of those key principles that, that were mentioned by my colleague Claire Adamson. And I, I do think that they offer young people a wonderful chance through the medium of arts to develop themselves as individuals and to learn new skills. Putting those young people at the heart of the strategy, I think, is the right thing to do. They will help to determine what the priorities should be and will play a leading role in finding out what works and what doesn't. I'm sure there will be quite a few surprises along the way with this. Of course, it's right to also see the strategy in terms of how it fits within something like Curriculum for Excellence. 
Engaging with the arts is not an optional external bolt-on to a young person's learning experience. It can be and should be very much at the heart of it. And schools do have a crucial role in helping our young folk to embrace an arts perspective that they can carry with them throughout their learning journey. I particularly like the focus on using new digital technologies, and both the Cabinet Secretary and Claire Adamson mentioned the importance of this. Anybody who takes the time to look at what young folk are creating, producing and sharing right now with their smartphones will be amazed at the originality of ideas and the speed at which these spread and adapt. New styles of art, music and film are emerging because the technology is decent enough at the moment to allow that. But the technology, of course, is simply the enabling tool that offers expression for creative thinkers and artists. What a fantastic opportunity there is here to nurture that creativity. And as we see super-fast 4G services becoming more widespread, along with the scaling up of storage capacity, I'm really looking forward to seeing what might come out of this particular development. Perhaps some budding new Scottish creative industry will emerge, not to mention the international collaborations possible mentioned by Christian Allard. Presiding officer, for me, one of the most worthwhile inclusions in the strategy are the thoughts and ideas about how we might balance up participation and exclusion. We know that many youngsters from, for example, the black, Asian and other minority ethnic groups are always underrepresented in the arts, and I very much welcome the commitments to try and address that. But a striking comment in the strategy too revealed to us that many children who live in poverty in Scotland have no access whatsoever to the arts very often because of the more obvious reasons of lack of resources or transport. But in households too, where there might be a disabled parent, this often means that youngsters and their families simply can't participate in the arts. So therefore, making it easier for young disabled people in particular to access culture in the arts can do so much to boost their confidence in self-esteem. And so I'm immensely proud that this is recognised as a key principle to be addressed and I really look forward to seeing how this, this is tackled. With that theme in mind, can I bring to the attention of members the work carried out by Centre Stage in my constituency in Kilmarnock, and I should declare an interest as, as one of their patrons. Centre Stage is a social enterprise theatre company who offer a huge range of performing arts experiences to many youngsters from a variety of backgrounds, many of whom are disabled or who are struggling to cope with the pressures of society. About 1,800 people or so attend there, and the whole ethos is about providing them with opportunities to access the arts and to develop their skills and leadership capabilities. They recognise and work hard on many of the issues articulated within the youth arts strategy on inclusion and participation. So much of their work sits perfectly, I think, with the aims set out here. And I recall that the Cabinet Secretary also visited the theatre company a number of years ago to, to, see for, to see that for herself. Presiding officer, I think the strategy is a, is a wonderful piece of work and de deserves the full support of the Parliament. It's innovative, it's exciting, and offers our young people some fantastic opportunities to unleash their creative talents. It's also inclusive, and it reaches out to our most disadvantaged and disabled youngsters, whose talents will find expression beyond the limitations of their own circumstances. I'm very confident this will be a huge success and I'm looking forward with anticipation to see what happens once those creative doors are well and truly opened. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Richard Lyle to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, <coughs> President Officer. I also am very pleased to speak in this debate today in order to highlight the excellent opportunities being provided to the young people of Scotland in their artistic goals, whether it's on the stage, the screen, behind the scenes or in one of Scotland's world leading creative industries. Time to shine comprehensively yet practical stra stra strategic, strategic aims to en en enrich young people's lives through the arts and cre creativity by focusing on three key themes creating and sustaining engagement, nurturing potential and talent, developing the infrastructure and support. It is important to instil in our youth a love and curiosity for culture, regardless of their 
class background ground of where they live, as just has been mentioned by Wally Coffey. And it has been shown that immersion in cultural activity can help bolster the future resilience and well-being of communities and individuals. This is important to Scotland's children, and I am proud to support the investment in this area. In order to carry out the strategy, we will be required to invest time and money. However, I am pleased to say we will not be starting from scratch, as it's the strategy builds upon the strong foundations of a well-established, forward-thinking youth arts sector. Scotland is already remarkable in that we have a range of the national youth arts companies for theatre, dance, music. Claire Adamson uh, a minute ago mentioned real-time music, uh, which is located also in my region, in Newt Hill. This group are working hard to include and expand youth provision and uh, encourage youth in the area to come into uh, the ba basic forms of, of art. The Curriculum for Excellence also heavily features the arts, recognising the expressive arts, providing opportunities to underpin and enrich learning in all other curriculum areas. Despite the strong basis on which to build, it is important that we do not grow complacent, but look for new ways to improve provision with from within every community across the length and breadth of Scotland, so that every young person can benefit from culture. Also in my region in North Lanarkshire, the Creative Re Residency provides opportunities to all S4 and S5 pupils across all 24 of North Lanarkshire secondary schools. The programme begins at the start of the calendar year, enabling pupils to attend a, a series of taster sessions, highlighting the various disciplines on offer. Following this, the pupils can submit applications to participate in a week-long arts residency in Kilbowie Outdoor Centre in June. Kilbowie is, as we all know, is set in one of the most picturesque sites in Scotland. Further to this, these same pupils are then given the opportunity to participate in a master class, allowing them to hone their skills learnt while in the outdoor centre. Finally, their work is showcased in an exhibition and event in Summer Lee Music, Museum of Scottish Industrial Life in Cope Ridge. This is just one example of the excellent infrastructure Time to Shine has to build upon, and so I am confident that it will be a success and enrich the lives of the young people of Scotland. Time to Shine aims to be inclusive as it possibly recognises the different needs of the large age, age group from 0 to 25. It also recognises the terms, the arts, meaning different things to different people and can refer to activities well beyond the traditional definitions. This is a long-term strategy which is committed to developing the opportunities for at least the next generation of young people. The consultation made three main themes that uh, should be incorporated into a programme in order for it to meet its full potential. Participation is all important, whether it's for as an active participant or as a member of the audience. Both are of equal importance, and each individual should determine how they want to engage with the arts. Many factors impact on how our young people engage with the arts, where they live, family environment, their peers, the cost, transport. Time to Shine will work to remove these barriers so that young people can engage with the arts how they see fit. Those involved or wishing to get involved in the arts must be able to progress through their chosen field. For some, this means developing their skills to a recognised standard. For others, the progression may mean that the arts have helped them recognise their personal qualities that will help them grow in confidence and help them in their other areas of their lives. Scotland is very fortunate to have a pool of highly talented, dedicated artists, practitioners and organisations who work hard to deliver high-quality activities for those interested in the arts. These dedicated people, and I pay tribute to them today, seek to provide the twin goals of engaging as, as many young people as possible and supporting the ongoing development of those with particular talent. The Time to Shine strategy encourages this work and proposes ways of sharing information and best practice to foster more collaborative working and sustainability. 
To finish, presiding officer, I'm sure this government recognises the positive impacts that arts and creativity can have. This cabinet secretary, and I have to pay tribute to her, has shown her commitment to widening opportunities for everyone to access and benefit from the cultural activity so that Scotland can be an international leader in youth arts. Can I personally thank her for all her hard work on behalf of the people of Scotland? It is her time, and certainly she shines with her enthusiasm for the arts and promoting the cultural ties that Scotland has shown that it has. Scotland is immersed in cultural, in cultural and historical circumstance, and I commend the Cabinet Secretary for this debate today, this debate today and also for her commitment to culture. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Kezia Dogdale to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the debate this afternoon? Um, this time last week, we were debating the youth work strategy, and I was reflecting on that debate in preparation for today, just about the degree to which the two strategies are interlinked. And there are references to the arts in the youth work strategy, but I think it's just uh, worth reminding ourselves today how much of the work around youth arts is done by youth workers across the country and indeed uh, in community groups and that we should place a, a high uh, value on that. Um, the last time the Minister was before us at Culture Questions, she may remember that I put some specific questions to her about support for piping in Scotland, and piping is also referenced in her motion today. Um, there is a concern, certainly Edinburgh, uh, around the degree to which um, young people can study piping, either through music tuition in schools or through local community groups, because they tend not to be um, instruments which are particularly supported with public funds. Uh, and those parents um, have raised a specific concern with me about the future uh, impact of that on our cultural heritage. For example, the ability to get school piping bands, specifically school, state school piping bands, to play at the Edinburgh Tattoo. And she'll be familiar that at the recent school uh, piping championships, many of the winning categories were won by private schools. And there is a sense that if we're not very careful, there will be a propensity for only private schools to be able to um, offer piping. And I think that would be a great shame if we allowed that to happen. So I would urge her to have a specific look at that. Those same parents were also quite concerned about um, the willingness of music teachers in schools to allow pupils to pick the pipes as an instrument as part of their SQA exams. And the parents described it as almost a degree of snobbishness around the pipes uh, because they weren't seen as a sort of classical instrument, an instrument that you could play in an orchestra, which a lot of music, music tuition is geared towards in terms of orchestral um, work. So I just would encourage her to um, speak to her education colleagues about that. Uh, and if she has any update uh, on what's happening there, I would very much welcome it. I also come to the chamber with a specific ask to the minister. I wonder, given that these constituents come from varied parts of Edinburgh, uh, whether she might meet with me and them to discuss their programme of what they think the government could do around the piping agenda. They have, as they uh, refer to it, a pipe dream of uh, every child in Scotland having a right to learn the pipes, and it's very much something that uh, I would support and agree with, and I'd like to bring those constituents to her if she'd be willing to meet with them. That also takes us on to some wider questions around music tuition in schools, and she'll be very familiar, I'm sure, with the Scotland on Sunday campaign, uh, Let Them Play, which did some very thorough work around the cost barriers, the tuition costs and the rental costs associated with instruments. Now, I would like to hear a little bit more from the Minister today about what joint work she's doing with Alistair Allen, who I understand has ministerial responsibility for music tuition, just to see how that work in particular uh, is progressing. Um, I'd like to focus on colleges uh, for a little bit, presiding officer. It's been mentioned a couple of times uh, today already, but I think given that the Opportunities for All agenda uh, forces our colleges to focus specifically on the 16 to 19 year old agenda, that actually the role around youth art strategy is ever more important. And there's a couple of different aspects of that that I'd like to share with her. Uh, she'll be aware that colleges provide a lot of um, courses and, and support around the technical skills which support the arts, particularly sound, lighting, film, etc. And she'll also be aware that these courses tend to be the most expo expensive courses for colleges to put on, perhaps behind things like mechanical engineering, where the costs are a little bit higher. But because of the, the core cost of these courses, it's very easy for those to be cut uh, and for courses which are cheaper to run to be increased in their numbers to produce an overall effect of student places being maintained at the same rate. And I would encourage you just to look carefully at the impact uh, of skills and courses available in the creative sector uh, around the college cuts agenda. 
Um, there's some excellent work happening in our colleges just now, which I think is really important to highlight. And I would encourage you to look very closely at what Edinburgh College are doing. She might be familiar that they have three artists in residence at the moment at Edinburgh College, one on filmmaking, uh, one in photography, and one on art. And the one in filmmaking is a guy called Gary Fraser, who I think the Cabinet Secretary has met before, who's recently won a Scottish BAFTA for the film work that he's done. He's from uh, Muirhouse uh, in Edinburgh, and uh, accessed college as a pathway out of addiction and not only is he making groundbreaking award-winning films, but he's also working with some really hard-to-reach young people across Edinburgh, giving them the confidence, the self-esteem that they need to access education and to progress with their lives. And I think that um, that should be particularly valued. Um, Edinburgh College also on Friday had a Creative Industries Employability Day uh, where they devoted the whole day to encouraging young people to look at the types of careers and opportunities that they could access in the arts. Um, courses such as how to work as a photographer, looking at the events industry, uh, organisational versus technical side of events, community arts, interactive media, freelancing in the music industry, really core skills which could offer future educational opportunities for our young people. And she'll also be aware that Creative Exchange, which is a partnership between Edinburgh College and Edinburgh City Council was nominated for a Scottish Business Award this week uh, for the nature of the work it's doing around providing a state-of-the-art space uh, and resources and business support for entrepreneurs uh, and people interested in making the creative industry uh, a business. They narrowly missed out on that award, but I think it's a tremendous achievement uh, within the first year of that organisation existing that they've made it to the shortlist of the Scottish Business Awards, and we should welcome that. All those wonderful examples of work in our colleges set against a cuts agenda from this government to our colleges. I don't know if the Minister is aware, but this week Edinburgh College have announced that they're going to have to make 70 voluntary redundancies between now and November. So on the one hand, we have all this excellent work, but on the other hand, the college is going through a terrible time, really low morale, having to cope with redundancies which have been forced on it, I'm afraid to say, by this government's focus on HE at the expense of further education. Of course. Cabinet no, Secretary. The member will know, and obviously it's a responsibility of my, my other colleagues in, in government, but the spend in terms of the budget for colleges has actually, in terms of relation to the, 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 what we inherited in 2007, and we've, have, we've managed to maintain that level, which is quite, quite remarkable, bearing in mind the cuts we've had across government from the Westminster provision in the budget. So, yes, I, these are repeated debates, but she has to acknowledge that. Is there a drug deal, and I can compensate you for the intervention. Okay. I mean, the, the Minister makes a point saying that the, the amount of money going to colleges is, is the same as it was in previous administrations. How then can she justify the fact that there are 140,000 fewer students studying our colleges since 2007, 93,000 fewer women studying part-time? If you equate that over each year that this government's been in power, that's almost a quarter of a million fewer people being able to access a further education um, opportunity. The Minister shakes her head at me, but these are the reality of the figures that are set out by the Scottish Funding Council. They're not my figures, they're her government's figures. So she shakes her head, she needs to look at the detail and accept the reality of what those figures tell her. Um, just in closing, presiding officer, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'll just make one mention to community arts, and in particular, Craig Miller Community Arts. On a Tuesday night, would invite the minister to come and see Drammy Dodgers, where they put on specific work for the 8 to 21-year-old age group. So you've got intergenerational learning there, loads of people in the Craig Miller community coming together uh, to um, develop their skills around drama. I think it's a really positive community development bit of work, and I would encourage the minister to attend. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And I now call Joan McAlpine to be followed by George Adam. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I too um, welcome the time, time Strategy, putting young people at the heart of Scotland's creative future. Um, and before I start, I should maybe declare an interest in that I have a daughter who benefited from the Youth Music Initiative um, through the Voice Factory Choir in uh, Glasgow. And, uh, I am very well aware of the difference that that Youth Music Initiative has made to the lives of hundreds of young people across the country, uh, whatever their background. Um, so I would like to just start by, by praising that and praising the new commitment to the Youth Music Initiative, which was, of course, started by the previous administration, and I acknowledge and congratulate them on that. Um, I, want to, I want to start by talking about um, access in terms of... Uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds. One of the things about the Youth Music Initiative is it doesn't charge. And uh, although my own daughter would have probably had the opportunity anyway, there's a lot of people um, 
who get access to the arts through that, um, where in other, many other arts uh, offerings they are charged. Mm. Um, now, in Dumfries, we have got around that problem with a self-funding organisation uh, called the Electric Theatre. Um, it, it has a very popular adult community choir and adult theatre, and that, that charges, but that subsidises the main activities for children and young people through the youth theatre. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really important. And um, someone earlier mentioned that if you put young people at the centre of arts, I think it was Patricia Ferguson, you sometimes get some unusual approaches to big topics. Um, she mentioned, uh, I think it was the rap being used to illustrate the referendum. Um, the Dumfries Youth Theatre's Electric Theatre Workshop last year collaborated in an extraordinary piece of physical theatre called Blood Orange, uh, which was commissioned by the Environmental Arts Festival um, in Scotland, which is itself based in the region. Um, and some MSPs who attended the cross-party group on culture, which I co-convene, will have seen an extract from Blood Orange performed here in the Parliament. And those who missed it will get the chance to catch up by seeing it at the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, when I say that they take an unusual approach to a big, big uh, subject. A blood orange is a very good illustration of that um, because it was inspired, if that can be the word, by the experience of a racist march by the English or Scottish Defence League um, in Dumfries in early 2013. Um, the Local Trades Council and the EIS Teachers Union had organised a very effective cross-party, cross-community protest against this racist march. Um, and it attracted many of the young people from the theatre who were at the time performing another play which involved superheroes. So they, they donned their superheroes like outfits and formed a very colourful front line against, uh, in the fight against fascism probably for the first time. But it guaranteed great coverage in the local paper. But on the serious side, the experience had a real effect on these young people who then went away and workshopped uh, Blood Orange. Uh, which is a very, very serious and raw uh, piece of theatre concerning the insidious nature of racism and, and how it can feed off envy and poverty. And the other great thing about it is that they had it in the local nightclub, Chancers. Uh, so it was the kind of place where young people in the town would feel comfortable uh, going to see a, a, a piece of theatre. Um, Patricia first can also mention the need to concentrate on all parts of the country uh, and I, I agree with that so I'm very pleased that the Scottish Youth Theatre are holding one of their summer courses for young people in Dumfries this year as well as in Glasgow and Aberdeen and so I, I would want to praise that and praise the creation of the youth arts hubs that the minister mentioned as part of the youth arts strategy around the country. I would have liked to have seen one of the hubs in Dumfries um, of course and that, see the, the the further south hub is in air, but I hope the door is not completely closed on that because I know that the minister knows um, that Dumfries is a, a real Scottish leader in youth arts uh, in terms of finding ways to pull young people who would otherwise be marginal, marginalised into, into the arts. Um, yes, yes. Um, I, I don't know if the, the, the member had recalled my opening statement where I actually made the point that they recognise that the south of Scotland is an area that they'll need to have regional intervention in relation to the hubs, but of course some of the applications were so strong that they expect them to come back as part of the regular funding. So uh, there is a recognition that the south of Scotland in particular uh, will be addressed. Yeah, I, I apologise if I, if I missed that part of your speech, but I, I welcome it um, nevertheless. Um, I would also like to mention the important role played over a long period of time um, by the Hollywood Trust, which is a charitable trust which has particular interest in young people in the arts in the southwest of Scotland. And uh, as another example of, uh, of all the, the collaboration that we were talking about earlier, if I could just give one example of how um, a small grant can make a difference um, about. 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, the Hollywood Trust gave a small individual grant uh, because it's, they, they offer individual grants as well as large grants to organisations. They offered an individual grant to a teenager from the Lough Side um, housing scheme in, Dumf in Dumfries, um, which is, um, it has challenges. Um, he couldn't study drama in the town as a, uh, in the Saturday classes, so they gave him money to travel to college in another part of the country. And that young man then 
went on to the Conservatoire or the RCS, as it was then, and had a very successful career all over Europe, including London and Ireland and Spain. And then in his 30s, he came back to Dumfries, where he established the Electric Theatre that I I mentioned earlier, and the Big Burn Supper Festival, which has exposed a whole new generation of young people uh, from different backgrounds to getting involved in the arts. Um, and it's had a huge economic impact in the town. So I think that is a really good illustration of how quite a small, a small grant to allow a young you man to, to travel close, by please? train uh, to classes can actually have a huge impact on many, many different lives. And that's why I welcome the collaboration inherent in the strategy and the motion. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Now I'll call on George Adam to be followed by Neil Bibby. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I support the Time to Shine strategy for youth arts. And in order to get to my point, I want to kind of go a roundabout way with a story. You know, my, my father, my dad, loved music. He was part of the rock and roll generation. He went to see Bill Haley in the comments down at the Odeon in Glasgow. Uh, and he would be the first one up to sing at any event he would go to. There was only one thing lacking in all of that, and that was the fact he had absolutely no musical talent whatsoever. He couldn't sing a note, he couldn't play a musical instrument, but he enjoyed the actual music, he enjoyed the arts, he enjoyed all that to such an extent that it made him extremely happy. So I think the strategy in itself actually is emphasising that it's not all about becoming professional musicians, it's not all about um, having a, even working within a certain industry within the arts. It's actually about being part of it and the difference it can make to all of our lives uh, from the point of our mental health point of view and uh, just making us genuinely feel happy. It's, it's rubbed off me. I love music. You'll see me walking about with my uh, iPod on all the time to come in to, before I come in, not in the chamber, incidentally, presiding officer, but uh, on the way to the chamber because these things, this can make a difference in people's lives. And I think that's one of the things that the Scottish Government are putting young people at the heart of Scotland's creative future, giving them the opportunity to be to, to design what uh, we're looking for here because that's how things have always worked. I think Kezia Dugdale mentioned the debate we had last week and if it's young people who are actually uh, part of it, they're pushing the programme forward, they're always the ones that are going to actually support it if they end up uh, by going down that route as well. And I think that's an extremely important part of it. You know, Scotland uh, obviously uh, does really well in this side of things, but it's good to see that the Scottish Government are wanting to be an international leader, leader in children and young people's arts by 2000. 23. And I think uh, the Scottish Government should be commended in its commitment to widening the opportunities for everyone to access, engage and benefit from cultural activity. Because regardless of background, regardless of where you come from, I think it's important that people do not think that there are certain parts of the arts that are not for them because of their own background. Because I can say from my own background, you know, there are things as I've got older that I appreciate now that I didn't necessarily appreciate when I was a younger man growing up. You know, but, presiding officer, I know what you're thinking at this stage. You know, when I'm talking about arts, creativity, culture and sheer talent. You know that the great town of Paisley is going to be mentioned at one place. You know, how can you not mention the place that's given us Paolo Natiri, Jerry Rafferty and the actors David Tennant, Gerard Butler and many more. But that doesn't just come from nowhere. That comes from lots of groups working within Paisley to ensure that these young people get the opportunities. And examples of such are Tommy McGrory, uh, does the Loud and Proud School of Rock in Paisley. And basically, he started it off because he was a B-flat bugler and he wanted a marching band. Eventually, at one stage, he decided that he would try the School of Rock as well. Just long story short, presiding officer, the marching band didn't quite work out and the rock and roll side has actually moved on. But that gives access to young people. Though some people have left uh, Loud and Proud and Paisley now are working as session musicians, so it's given them an access, not necessarily to be a star, but to actually have, so, uh, be able to uh, be something within the industry. And, you know, what he offers is there's an early years music club, beginners group lessons, one-to-one -one lessons and band sessions. And many of the bands have gone on to get access to competitions that they wouldn't necessarily have got an opportunity, even if they had been a band that had worked uh, in their own parents' garage and came out the cliché and came out and uh, managed to do something. They probably wouldn't have had the access that they currently do. 
The problem they do have, like a lot of organisations, I said this last week, is it's a year-on-year -year ongoing issue with funding. They have to use a basket of funding measures in order to try and keep things going. And if uh, there was one thing I would look at, I would say we'd probably have to look at that. But the Remshire Witch Hunt 1697, the, cab the Cabinet Secretary will remember that they, that was a, a ground-up uh, project where it was young people. I'm not saying anything about witches, I'm just saying you are here, <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. But Paisley has, Paisley has the unenviable uh, uh, record of being the last place in Europe to actually murder someone for being uh, for witchcraft. Now, one of that programme actually created a curriculum for excellence pack uh, from one of the Claire Cassidy, one of the teachers, one of the volunteers. She created that and worked with the local authority to ensure that people knew about uh, their own area, exactly uh, what the story was all about, why the horseshoe was at uh, Max Hilton Cross, why it was there, and it made people... And it's an important part of curriculum for excellence. I think it's something that's maybe been missed by the debate, as that's in the strategy as well, is how important that this will be a key part of the curriculum for excellence. Because we can join all this together. The pack ends up uh, asking uh, you know, the children the, and young and uh, older uh, young people as well about drawing their own conclusions about you know, what happened in the history. You know, was she really, did she really have, uh, was it witchcraft or did the women who accused them have uh, 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 mental health issues and it opens up all kinds of different questions and gives them a chance to explore it. Of course, the dramatic side was every year since we've actually, in the past two years, we've actually had a, a reenactment in the town centre. We don't literally uh, actually burn the witches at the end of it. It's just a, uh, it's just a, an, an enactment. But uh, you know, but people then know the story and they know that part of our history. And it's important you remember the good stuff as well as the negative. You know, it's a uh, Pace Theatre Company was formed by David Wallace in 1988. They have actually got an ethos of educate and entertain. One of their classic examples was when I brought uh, them along to for I Am Me, which is a, a play they're doing at the moment, which is about a young man has learning difficulties and uh, how his neighbours treat with them and it's about disability hate crime. But they, not only do the young people actually get the chance to act, they also get the opportunity to actually educate and engage with the local schools. You know, and the funny thing about PACE is, you know, everything comes full circle. The PACE Youth Theatre have actually uh, given the world Paolo Nutini, Gordon McCork, Corkill, I don't watch River City, so he's obviously there as well. Uh, Shona MacDonald and uh, the famous Fame Academy uh, winner David Snedden, as well as many other people who are also working within the industry. But again, it's not about working within the industry. It's about these groups giving the opportunity. So, presiding officer, I'll say there you have it. We're, we're just getting on with it in Paisley, nurturing talent and helping young people explore their potential through the arts. And what I would say is we've been doing it for years in Paisley, and I'm, I can commend the Scottish Government for encouraging the rest of Scotland to catch up with us. Thank you very much. I'm very, great. I'm very pleased to hear that witches are no longer at risk of a fiery end in Paisley. <laughs> and I call on Neil Bibby to be followed by Rob Gibson. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, thank you, President Officer. I think this has been a very interesting debate. It's allowed us to discuss a, a range of uh, issues to do with youth arts, what more can be done to promote it, and what we can learn from uh, different parts of Scotland and, and the UK and internationally too, as we know culture has no borders. As my colleague Patricia Ferguson said in our opening contribution, Scotland has a good record on participation on the arts, and certainly Labour and Government played our part to help this. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged in uh, the opening uh, statement of the, 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 the document of the strategy, we are not starting uh, at the beginning. And things like investment in cultural activities uh, being doubled entry to many museums and galleries uh, were made free in the mu Youth Music Initiative, uh, where a groundbreaking scheme introduced by the previous uh, Labour government to provide all pupils um, music tuition. All of these things were welcome moves, but it's clear we need to build on this and, and we need to look at how we can make arts more accessible to young people and particularly to young people in deprived communities. Not every young person will want to become a musician, a dancer or an actor, nor should they. I never had those aspirations. I was too busy playing football badly. But the key here is ensuring that the opportunities are there, that they are accessible and young people are encouraged and supported to make the most of their potential. I'm pleased, therefore, that inequalities are acknowledged uh, within the Youth Arts Strategy document, and an inclusive approach to involving young people is mentioned, as well as a strategic objective to address inequalities and develop mechanisms which allow 
access for all. I'm pleased that young people are due to form a, a national uh, youth advisory group. I was uh, going to ask the Minister how uh, young people involved in community art groups in Renfrewshire and Beclyde, Western Bartonshire and elsewhere uh, will have their views taken on board. Um, uh, but I know and I welcome what the Minister said in our opening contribution about uh, the involvement of uh, Young Scott and working to ensure that people from all uh, backgrounds will be involved in shaping that strategy. Uh, I very much welcome that. And I say this because, as members have highlighted in this debate, there are a number of excellent and inspiring uh, youth arts projects across Scotland. And this is no different, as George Adam has uh, demonstrated in, in Paisley and in Renfrewshire, where we have some uh, great examples. One such example is uh, the Pace Youth Theatre in Paisley, which has grown to become uh, the, the largest youth theatre of its kind in the UK, with a current membership of over 2,000 and over 200 young people awaiting places at any given time. Uh, the former uh, provost of Renfrewshire, Nancy Allison, reminded me recently that it's come a long way since she was first involved in its formation in 1988, when just seven children turned up for the first meeting. Then the project took its first steps in what has been their hugely successful aim of introducing young people to the arts, particularly those in deprived communities and who would otherwise not get such an opportunity. Many of these aims are still apparent today and the theatre now runs weekly workshops and drama for anyone aged 3 to 18, which aim to increase communication skills, confidence and self-expression. As George Adams says, a number of former uh, members have, have gone on uh, to uh, become uh, well-known actors and performers currently working in theatre, television and film. Um, Paolo Nettini, uh, James McAvoy uh, amongst them. Education has always been a central part of PACE's work and takes a number of different forms. Participatory performance projects allow primary school pupils the opportunity to perform to their peers of important issues such as bullying, drug awareness and healthy living. PACE also undertakes hundreds of community workshops each year in schools, libraries and other venues. And they host a hugely popular school holiday performing arts festival called FEST. These events usually involve a cast of young people coming together for one week to devise and rehearse a new production base on a fun theme. They are designed to be challenging as fun and are a great way for young people to get together, make friends and explore the creative side. I remember myself uh, when I was younger attending a Pace Youth Club on a couple of occasions. I did very much enjoy it, but as I said earlier, I had other interests that I wanted to pursue. Uh, but as I say again, it was great to have that opportunity available, and I have a number of friends who very much enjoyed uh, the opportunity of, of being involved in uh, Pace as well, and opportunities that should be available, uh, affordable and accessible uh, to all. I would also uh, draw members' attention to other um, youth arts projects in, in, in Paisley and Renfrewshire, as uh, George Adam mentioned, Loud and Proud, which works with a range of local organisations, including the Council, provide chances for children to learn how to play music from an early age. I've heard some of the musicians play at various events in Renfrewshire, and they are a credit to the local community. Similarly, I was delighted to have the opportunity to meet with young people from Erskine Music and Media studi Studio when they performed in the Scottish Parliament last year and hear about some of the excellent work being done there. The studio is run by Young People for Young People and their success at the 2013 Youth Link Scotland Awards was well deserved. This is another example of the positive and inspiring work happening in Renfrewshire at the moment. And, and uh, George Adam also mentioned uh, the Renfrewshire uh, which project. I would also uh, note the strategy talks about promoting um, arts amongst uh, looked after children and also in Renfrewshire um, we, we um, have the Kibble Education and Care Centre and uh, the children from the Kibble um, Centre came to the Scottish Parliament uh, to do a, a play about um, looked after children and their experiences and it was not only thought provoking it also demonstrated the artistic talents um, of, of the children involved. I welcome uh, the opportunity to praise these groups and highlight some of the important work they do, and I'm sure the Minister will acknowledge uh, this as well. In closing, Presiding Officer, there is a great deal of expertise in youth arts in Scotland that we need to build on, and there are great examples of how we make youth arts more accessible to young people, and particularly those from deprived areas. That must be the main focus of the strategy moving forward, and I'll be following closely to ensure that it does. Thank you. And thank you. I now call on Rob Gibson, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Uh, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Gibson. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I've uh, been interested to hear the various views around the uh, Chamber from different uh, parties uh, concerning their areas and about the overall strategy for uh, uh, the youth arts in Scotland. And uh, it's great to know that, uh, in fact, we've had a strong base to work from, but much of that base actually came from before the times of devolution. Indeed, the part I want to speak about is the fashion movement, which started with the first event in Barra in 1981, and the second fish joined it in Fish Ross in 1986. What were they? Well, they were uh, residential learning things which used music and Gaelic to encourage community uh, stimulus and uh, to give people a sense of belonging. And uh, these have developed into Fashion and Gale, which was developed in 1991, and is the umbrella organisation for this independent association of Fish, uh, supported by Creative Scotland, Board of Gaelic, the Highland Council, and the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And the reach is considerable. 30 or 40 fashion, reaching 13,000 young people annually, uh, according to their website. 6,300 of those taking part in those learning uh, weeks uh, or weekends or evening classes, and another 4,800 who, who, who've taken part in the Youth Music Initiative classes, which have been organised by the Fashion. And my point about concentrating on the expressive arts and in particular music is that uh, the fact of uh, the development of this organisation uh, meant that it was one of the ones which was actually looked at academically at a fairly early stage as well. Uh, and I want to quote from uh, the Comedia report, the social impact of the fashion uh, uh, in a wider European study of social purpose and value in the participatory arts from 1996. Francois Matarasso said that uh, the central role of the fashion were community, the importance of Gaelic, and the high level of artistic quality. And according to him, to him the fashion contribute to individual and personal development, social cohesion, community empowerment and self-determination, local image and identity, imagination and vision, and health well-being. These are remarkable words at a time when people were trying to make sure that our traditional music was available to lots of youngsters in our part of the world, in the Highlands, and indeed in the cities. And I was interested to hear the oblique reference to it from uh, Patricia Ferguson, when she talked about the fish movement, the fish and ensuring the continued relevance of the traditional <laughs> arts. Well, I would suggest that, in fact, many of the lessons that the uh, youth art strategy have learned is from some of these particular uh, organisations, such as the fish movement, because they're rooted in the music of this country, the indigenous music, but it's not in a cocoon. It has spread out to be interested in other forms of music, and people have progressed through the fashion movement and become uh, more rounded adults. Some of them have become professional musicians, and they've come from across uh, the, the spectrum of uh, ability and across the spectrum of income, because the likes of Face Roche in my own area make sure that people who can't afford to go away for two or three days, get some help to do so. So that inclusive part of it is, is something as well. But it's really important to recognise that uh, the folk music, the indigenous music, is something which you'd hope uh, as many of the children in Scotland as possible were actually exposed to. And it concerns me that uh, if it's only seen as something which is a part of the wider music scene, that we lose that centrality, that core value uh, that Francois Matarasso stated there. He said, you know, practically about fashion, rarely have I seen work whose quality and value spoke so eloquently for itself as that which I witnessed in Scotland. I know how far it is from the committee room to the Cayley, and I would urge all who want a more rounded understanding of the fashion to see, to hear, and to participate whenever the opportunity should arise. These are inspiring words in 1986, uh, and 1996, this was, uh, sorry, that, that was written. And when the face movement was 25 years old in 2006, 
many of these same values had been developed even further, not necessarily through the medium of Gaelic, but spawning a lot of collaboration with the gathering uh, in Gordon, uh, gatherings in the cities and uh, various other groups uh, in the towns as well. And it's also meant that young people have travelled to play music in the Fish movement to Ireland, Brittany, to Romania, where they're working uh, with children at the moment who are blind, uh, and to try and get guide dogs from part of the Fish. I was speaking to Fiona Dalgetty, the uh, director of uh, Fish Ross, at the weekend, uh, a performance of the, the, the music of blind 18th century musicians played by two blind artists of today with other musicians with them. It was a fantastic offering. And it shows the kind of range of interest that there is uh, from the traditional roots. And I would suggest that uh, with the Youth Arts Hub in the Highlands being curated by Face Ross, no more appropriate body is there to actually do that job. But it seems to me that we've got to recognise that children should be exposed to as much as possible to music and the other arts, the plastic arts as well as the expressive ones, but that if they miss out on understanding their own indigenous uh, music, they miss out on some of the richest tradition anywhere in the world. And the opportunity for them to do so is something which should open up to as many of the children of Scotland as possible. And I hope that uh, the youth art strategy can expose as many children as possible in future to the traditional instruments, the traditional song and uh, theater, and all these elements which make up a core part of the culture of this nation. Many thanks. And we now move to the closing speeches. And I call on Mary Scanlon, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can, can I just, as a Highlands and Islands MSP, thank uh, Rob Gibson for his comments on the FASH movement. Uh, we all, all of us who represent the area know the excellent work that is done. And I would actually like to pay tribute to Rob Gibson because I know that he has had a significant involvement in the FASH movement in the past. Uh, there's been some excellent speeches today uh, covering the length and breadth of Scotland. Uh, and I think one in particular that struck me was Patricia Ferguson's, and really because uh, Patricia Ferguson brings the experience as a former culture minister and now uh, a continued commitment to the arts in opposition, and I very much welcomed her speech. Presiding officer, I hope I can start with an anecdote, and uh, you'll bear with me. But uh, we've been talking about inequalities all day and probably been talking more about um, the arts, uh, the music and drama, etc. But I would just like a quick anecdote on dancing, Scottish country dancing in particular. And uh, at my time of life, I thought I knew all about Scottish country dancing, having done it for more than six decades. And uh, when a friend of mine said, will you come along to a Scottish country dancing evening in Edinburgh, I thought as others have said about the exercise, the development, the well-being, the social side of it, and, and I thought, ticked all the boxes, so along I went. So the first dance was Hamilton House, never heard of it. The next dance was the Duke of Perth, never heard of it. Well, if I'd known it was the Bruins Reel, I might have had it go. The Reel of the 51st, never heard of it. And then Mary's Wedding. Uh, and, of course, I went along armed with my knowledge of the Gay Gordon, Stashing White Sergeant, Stripped the Willow and Ate Some Reel. And then I discovered, uh, having spoken to Cabinet Secretaries, such as Mr Russell, Mr Neil and others, I thought perhaps I was the odd one out, but they didn't know Hamilton House or the Duke of Perth or any others. And in further investigation, I actually discovered that... Um, if you were privately educated, you're much more likely to know these dances. But for those of us that uh, went to the country schools in the How of Merne, How of the Merns, haven't got any idea. So I'd like to come back to that about the inequalities, because since I got some coverage on this, I actually got emails for as far afield as San Diego, uh, California and saying the same thing that our own Scottish country dancing it's people in Scotland that are not being taught how to dance and it's something that is practiced worldwide so now that I've got that off my chest uh, just not to forget Scottish country dancing but I very much welcome and endorse all the words that Liz Smith said and uh, com uh, commend 
uh, all the organisations, including the National Youth Choir, National Youth Orchestra, and indeed the National Youth Pipe Band. Uh, but of course, one of the great challenges is ensuring that all children, whatever their background, have the opportunity to express themselves through arts and culture. So I was surprised when I looked at Scottish education. And while the numbers studying drama and music at higher have remained stable year on year, there's been an 8% fall in the numbers studying art and design. And similarly, there's reason to be concerned about the uptake of the Expressive Arts Baccalaureate, consisting of two advanced hires, a hire and an interdisciplinary project. The baccalaureate is designed to ease the transition into higher education or employment. However, the statistics published by SQA revealed that in the first year of implementation, five pupils, only five, enrolled in the Expressive Arts Baccalaureate. Perhaps a lack of demand, perhaps a lack of awareness, but whatever the case, when we're discussing this strategy today, I do think if we want to realise the ambitions in time to shine, I think it's certainly worth looking at. The second point I want to make concerns local authority music tuition, and Kezia Dugdale covered uh, much of what I want to say. I hope I can add to what she said. But last June, in the wake of the publication of Instrumental Music Tuition in Scotland report, the Scottish Government formed an implementation group to work towards realising uh, the report's recommendations. I appreciate the update is due by the end of this year, and I certainly look forward to seeing uh, what's in it. Various speakers have mentioned the financial, not just the financial pressures on councils, but the financial constraints that stops uh, pupils uh, at schools, particularly from deprived backgrounds, the opportunity to learn uh, uh, music tuition. Uh, prohibitive costs threaten this, uh, uh, particularly uh, on uh, people from a poorer background. I'm still gathering information, but it does seem that at most schools in Scotland, with their own pipe band, they are private schools. Uh, and I'm pleased to hear what Jane Baxter said, because she did mention that Fife Council had supported a pipe band within Fife, but it's actually quite difficult to, to realise that. So um, uh, we're actually seeing not just dancing being the preserve of upper classes or those at private schools, but access to playing the bagpipes. Um, so to offer a specific example, my re uh, office recently have been doing a Freedom of Information uh, into uh, access and cost uh, to the, the bagpipes. And uh, a number of large local authorities, including Edinburgh and Aberdeenshire, do not include bagpipes within their individual instrument music choice. And moreover, within council areas, there are significant differences. For example, North Lanarkshire confirmed that of the 121 primary schools in the authority, only 13 schools uh, are actually able to access lessons in the bagpipes. And in the interest of fairness, in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, lessons in piping are av av available in three out of 16 secondary schools. So it's very much a case of postcode prescribing. I have read the recommendations here, and I'm just winding up here. I have read the recommendations uh, because I, I would have commended the government on it. Uh, I've read them very carefully, and I think Willie Coffey made a very good point about access. And although I've read the strategic objectives, they are all worthy, but they point. are woolly, and I'm not sure that they are at this stage sufficiently focused on inequalities to address the gap. Thanks very much. Okay. Now, Colin Patricia Ferguson, up to nine minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This has been a very interesting, I think a very good debate, and certainly I've enjoyed very much listening to uh, the, the contributions that colleagues have made, particularly when they've talked about uh, matters pertaining to their own particular areas, because one of the beauties of this Parliament is that you get to share that kind of information and you get to hear about other people's enthusiasms and, and complaints as well sometimes. So it's, it's been really um, interesting from that point of view. Um, 
I think Liz Smith made a very good point in her opening speech about um, the propensity of arts organisations perhaps to be congregated a little bit around Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, although I think Mr Adam would probably make a claim that they stretch out a little bit uh, into Paisley as well. And of course, he's absolutely right about that. And some of that leakage from Glasgow into Paisley is, is obviously to be welcomed. But... but <laughs> Um, and I say that as someone who's enjoyed very many arts performances in Paisley. Um, but I think, uh, joking aside, that that's one of the wonderful things actually about the arts is that if we all stop and think about what's happening in our own areas, we've all got good stories to tell. And the point of what we're trying to talk about today, I think, is how we take that one step further on and then another step further on. So it's, it really is genuinely interesting to hear what colleagues have got to say. And I think Jane Baxter very eloquently demonstrated the point that many, if not most, young people actually do access the arts through local organisations like the work that's going on in the Alhambra Theatre in her area and that local authorities are vital in that regard. And it's interesting to hear that because, in a sense, it chimes a little bit against what uh, Willie Coffey was saying in that Willie, I th Mr Coffey, I think, um, was making the point that often the arts are the first thing to be cut. And he's right about that, although I would hope that it's fair to say that across the lifetime of this parliament, that hasn't been the case with any of the governments that have had the opportunity to preside over this area. But it can be the case with local authorities. And I think that that is a shame. And I think it is something that people should think again about. And I know that a number of our youth performing arts companies have found their funding from local authorities has either been diminished or has ended altogether. Now, clearly, we want these organisations to thrive. And I think it behoves us all to talk to our local authority colleagues and to encourage that enthusiasm for the arts that I think they actually have, but they sometimes find difficult to manage. Ian MacArthur. Ferguson for taking the intervention. I, I entirely agree with what she's saying about the importance of local, local authorities um, supporting this. Would she uh, share my concern that sometimes where pressure is placed upon central government um, to fill the gaps that have been left, in a sense there's a risk that what you end up doing is, is rewarding bad behaviour uh, and not necessarily celebrating and rewarding and supporting the good behaviour of local authorities that haven't made those cuts. I would agree with that entirely and I think it's a very difficult call to get the judgment right on and get the balance right on and I think it's one where we all have to stop and consider what's actually happening out there. Um, I was very interested in some of the points Claire Adamson made and I think she's absolutely right that peer support is important. Of course it is and young people benefit from their friends and their relatives telling them that they did well. We all like to be told that even if for some of us it doesn't happen very often. But, you know, it is nice when it does. And I think it's great for young people, particularly going forward. And I think Ms Adamson very, um, uh, very well made my case for Systema, frankly, and about the, the, the joy that that brings, but also the way in which it helps young people with their learning and with their, their life as they go forward. It's, it's, a, a, it's an all-encompassing opportunity, I think, Systema, and that's why... I am such a fan of it. Um, my colleague Kezia Dugdale, I think, made a number of very valid points. Uh, firstly, about the fact that often the people delivering the arts in our local communities are not perhaps trained artists, but they're development workers with an interest or an aptitude in the arts who bring all their skills and their talents to that contribution. And I think the point that has been made now by Kezia Doug Dugdale and by Mary Scanlon about the playing of the pipes is very important and it strikes me that the pipes are fast becoming culture's equivalent of rugby in that you have to have gone to a certain school in order to be able to play the pipes and I think that's actually very sad and detrimental. Happy to Mr well, Gibson. There was a point I was just going to try and make, thank you for taking this, that uh, the Sutherland Schools Pipe Band, the Kintyre Schools, they are small schools in the countryside, so having one in each school is nearly impossible. But there are groups of schools where there are pipe bands in the Highlands. Patricia Ferguson. Yeah, I thank Mr Gibson for that. And actually, I, I was going to come on to Mr Gibson next, because I think he may have misunderstood my reference to Fashion Nagel. Um, I've got nothing but praise for Fish and the Gale, but I think one of the things they've done on top of all the other things that he listed, and he's right to list them, is that they have helped to continue that interest 
in our traditional instruments and in our traditional language and our traditional music and have kept that flag flying, perhaps when it was more difficult to do so in times gone past. But I do think that they have, uh, particularly Fesh and Ross, have a fantastic uh, reputation and have been really imaginative in the way they've used the Youth Music Initiative to take that forward. But I think one of the challenges we have with the Youth Music Initiative is that if a young person comes forward and says, I would like to be able to play the pipes or I'd like to be able to play the bassoon, and that school happens to have six violins and two violas, then it's very difficult. And I think that's probably one of the challenges that we have to take up going forward in the future. Um, Neil Bibby was absolutely right to major on the idea of equalities. And I think he's right to identify looked after children. We know the challenges looked after children face in all aspects of their lives. And if we can't deliver for them in this area, then we really need to think again. And I'm really pleased that the strategy is going to do that. But I would also want to talk about the equalities in a, a slightly wider sense, because um, there are now many communities living in Scotland with their own cultures. And the example I have in my own constituency is the Mary Hill Integration Network, where people of all cultures come together and enjoy one another's art, one another's dance, one another's drama and music. And that, to me, is a real um, joy to behold. And it is a really good way of breaking down the barriers that might otherwise exist in an area. And they have done that for a number of years now and done it very, very successfully. In closing, um, presiding officer, because I think I'm coming close to that point, Liam MacArthur drew attention to the value of festivals. And I think he's absolutely right that festivals are a really important way of coming together and of sharing the experience and of giving people a stage on which to perform. And it strikes me that if we're talking about an arts awards scheme, perhaps we also start to think about whether or not we could have an annual youth arts festival in Scotland, perhaps at the same time as the Edinburgh Festival, perhaps not. Perhaps we build on one of the existing festivals that's out there, perhaps we don't. But I really think that young people coming together would be such a creative opportunity. It would help them all to raise their game, give them all new ideas about what they would want to do in the future. And I just think that if we could harness that kind of potential, we would be doing the whole country a favour. Presiding officer, I think it's fair to say that all contributors today have been concerned to make sure that this strategy is for all of Scotland's young people, regardless of their circumstances. And in that regard, I particularly welcome it. Many thanks. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you have until 4.59. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think I'll start with a quote from Albert uh, Camus. Without culture and the relative freedom it implies, society, even when perfect, is but a jungle. And that is why an, any authentic creation is a gift to the future. Um, Presenting us, I think this has been a, a, a very good debate. Um, if there was a portrait of a nation, um, I think it's been painted here today in the different reflections of the different parts of the country, uh, but also, I think, also shows um, the strength of what's happening just now. So I was quite clear that the youth art strategy is about building on that firm foundation that we already have, but taking us forward and with that stretch. Uh, we've heard across the chamber um, a, a variety of different enthusiastic and considered views. Um, I particularly appreciated the points from George Adam about, remember, it's about enjoyment and joy. And can I reassure him that Paolo Nettini from Paisley's Caustic Love is on constant play um, in my character, a wonderful, magnificent uh, piece of music, a musical triumph. And to Neil Bibby, who perhaps... Uh, was denied culture as much when he was younger. He said he was focused on football. One of the best cultural experiences I saw was a theatre performance of Archie Gemmell's Goal at the Theatre Royal in Glasgow by Off Kilter, where basically there was about 12 dancers in unison uh, replaying the Archie Gemmell's Goal. So it's part about reaching and connecting. Art is everywhere, I said, even, even in football. Um, Indeed. <laughs> MacArthur. Can I reassure the Cabinet Secretary, uh, having witnessed firsthand Neil Bibby's goal celebration, I think alive and dancing is, is alive and well in the Bibby household. <laughs> Thanks for that. 
Cabinet Secretary. OK, at that point, between Neil Bibby's dancing and Patricia Ferguson's rap in terms of, of, of our portrayal, we can see that we can uh, uh, express ourselves in different, way, different ways. Um, in terms of the debate, I think there's a number of uh, very important points that have been made. I think it's clear that across the Chamber there's a shared passion and commitment to ensure that all of our young people are given the opportunity to experience culture and the joy, the challenge, the energy, the expression, the understanding and the questioning that arts bring to young people must be core to our story. So I'm, I'm pleased that there's a consensus around how important culture is to our society and our young people, but there are important points that have been addressed uh, that I want to, to try and come on to. Um, the youth arts help us and help young people to develop skills that were needed in the modern world, flexibility, the ability to solve problems, communicate, learn new skills, be creative and innovative and strive for excellence. Um, and indeed, the enrichment uh, for our young people is very important. Um, there are also uh, wonderful examples of culture making a difference to our young people. Uh, cashback for creativity, which I, I will stress again, is engaging with young people um, at risk of turning to crime and antisocial behaviour and making a real impact on their lives. And obviously there's, a, a, there's been a running theme about issue of access. Um, one of the uh, points on wider access is looking at what Scottish Ballet is doing just now. Um, it's their innovative The Close project. It provides a first-time ballet experience for young adults some of whom have, are excluded from mainstream education. And the Close aims to empower participants by welcoming their creative ideas, building their confidence, communication, self-expression and creative skills. Um, Liam MacArthur, in his contribution, talked about Orkney, and he'll be aware of the wonderful example of the Orkney PD Schools Orchestra uh, next month. All of the pupils in Orkney's smallest schools will come together for the third year to form an orchestra with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra of Musicians in a project delivered in partnership with Orkney Islands Council. So the real challenge we have in the youth strategy is to make sure that we can reach either geographically but also with the different groups um, in society. In terms of uh, the points that have been raised in the debates, um, a number of issues I wanted to address. Uh, there were questions about how do we do things in terms of the Systema project, take it forward. Aberdeen are wanting to, to take the project forward uh, as part of our funding from across the different uh, departments in government. We've also helped uh, Systema think about what they do next in terms of uh, development. Dundee, we're supporting Dundee. They're looking at different art forms in terms of their Aspire programme. And again, I'm sure the Parliament will want to take a close interest in that. There's been mention also of colleges and universities, and I think that's an important point. And I want to address the issue of the demand that we are collectively creating in, in terms of the consequence of the YMI. We're now seeing the, the young people who have had that opportunity in early years then wanting to take that up um, in, in secondary, and then that's creating a demand itself. Not always necessary for qualifications, though I'm pleased to see that the number of advanced hires in the last year we have figures for, for expressive arts are up 8%, music up 12%. But I think what that, what that demand means is that, uh, one, orchestras are growing in terms of schools and different experiences, uh, but also in terms of the demand to, to play in different instruments. And sometimes it's the travel to another school that's causing the issue around tuition payment. I will ask um, Alistair Allen to, at the earliest opportunity that he can to update those who have inquired about the, the tuition fees issue. Yep. Smith. Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention, uh, the point that Mary Scanlon was making about the... Uh, possibility of interdisciplinary work in terms of the baccalaureate, which leads to some of the uh, issues that you're talking about, would presumably be very beneficial. And it's a, it's a worry that there, there aren't more children taking up that particular course. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, part of the lead up is to make sure that you have more people being able to do more advanced hires and hires. And I'll take an example of how we've actually got to manage um, the, the supply of, of what we provide from our colleges and universities to meet that growing demand. Um, there was a shortage of dance teachers to, to teach um, either standard grade or then the nationals and then higher. So one of the things I was instrumental in was making sure that the Royal Academy of Music and Drama uh, were able to be provided with funding from the Funding Council to have a higher degree in dance that would allow more higher degree uh, in terms of hires being taught in schools by teachers who were qualified with a degree uh, in dance, as well as providing uh, you know, the, the, the professional career path for our dancers. So that's one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that we're making, we have the teachers, uh, we have the provision. And I do want to take on, on the issue on the piping, of which uh, Kezia Dale will know I've got a keen interest, and I'm more than happy to look further into this issue um, with her and others. There is a challenge because there are very good pipe pipers in schools and very good pipe bands. 
James Gillespie High School is in, in this city, as Kezi Dugdale know, uh, great performers. Uh, we've heard also from uh, Rob Gibson in relation to um, the Kintyre bands, who are doing fantastically well if you look at the competitions. West Lothian, uh, where I represent, they created a West Lothian school's pipe band only in recent years. But I also know from looking into this, there is a bit of a tension between the, um, the, the, the different bands that compete in terms of their junior, their novices, etc., and, see, and them seeing, many of them have young people, the tuition, the tuition, have tuition themselves for young people, but seeing the school's bands and competition. So we need a system that takes everybody forward. But I do hear your points, and although I don't personally curate the tattoo, I will see what I could do in terms of <laughs> finding out from the, the Brigadier, Brigadier Alfred his choice of which bands are taken. To Mary Scanlon, I know she's passionate about the dance issue. Come to Lindley School in July, Take part in the hopscotch. Whatever dance places that she's been going to that she feels is rather exclusive, she's more than welcome where we join with tourists to do the, the dancing in the Lisco Palace during the summer months. Mary Scanlon. Could I ask the Minister if she can do the Duke of Perth, Hamilton House and the 51st and Mary's Wedding? Can no, I can't, can, but I must say, I'm, I'm, more than, I'm more than happy with the Gay Gordons and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of Strip the Willow and in terms of the Shetland, Shetland Reel, I think there are, in terms of the, the, the dancing capabilities that I have, uh, uh, I think that's more than enough to see me by. I want to address some of other issues. I thought in terms of Liz mentioning uh, the Turner Prize winners, really important, again, in terms of the quality of the teaching that takes place at GCA in particular, and we wish them all well. I was very pleased that we supported Duncan Campbell, in particular at the Venice Biennale. I saw his work when I was there last year, but she's also right to consider the role of families and participation. Um, Jane Baxter mentioned the Happy Lands, I think also emphasising the importance of communities and that point of access for communities with arts as well. And in relation to some of the other areas, I, I think Willie Coffey was right to say the digital expression that we now see and the digital creativity of young people is quite, quite incredible. Uh, and I think that's going to take the youth art strategy into different areas and is why internationally people are so impressed with the work that's been carried out. Uh, President Officer, in relation to uh, other aspects, um, we, are, we do want time to shine to develop. It is about uh, creating opportunities, nurturing the fantastic talent that we have across Scotland, um, involving people uh, early, making sure that young people drive the policy is something that's very important. And inclusion is very uh, core and key to our policy. Young people's voices must be found nurtured and given support, striking a balance between nurturing and guidance, offering space for the independence and freedom to express their views and have them listen to with respect is a challenge. Um, Time to Shine is uh, an attempt to engender a sense of inclusivity and responsibility. Um, and I do think, and it's a theme that's come through every single contribution, that arts and culture can give a real beneficial effect to a young person's sense of belonging uh, to their place, to their community, um, and I can see that very well. Um, I think in relation to the issues around piping, actually, reflecting on some of the other points of the debate, YMI has been ve used very effectively in many ways. The youth brass band movement, if I was to say to you that uh, um, in 2007 there were six youth brass bands in the whole of Scotland, uh, we now have almost 200. Quite, quite incredible in terms of the growth supported by YMI. And I think that, again, t tells us we're creating a demand that we have to meet in terms of support later on. So arts and culture are fundamental to our quality of life. Everyone needs to benefit from them. I personally worked hard, and this government has, to defend youth arts and the culture budget. Um, arts are a response to individuality and our nature. It helps to shape our identity. It transcends deep differences and stubborn differences and divisions and arts have a wondrous universal, universality and an enormous potential to unify and arts can speak many languages and across many cultures and they do not discriminate. Presiding officer, um, I think this has been a very good debate. I will um, ask uh, the team round Time to Shine to take forward all the demands, the invitation to work more with our colleges and universities, um, our reflection on the growth and idea of festivals. I thought the idea of a youth arts festival is one that is to be commended. Uh, and presiding officer, I started um, my contribution with a quote from one Albert, Albert Camus. I want to finish my uh, contribution with a quote from another Albert. Um, we must bear in mind what Albert Einstein said, and he said, logic will get you from A to B, imagination 
will take you everywhere. Presiding officer, I'd like to thank everyone for their contributions in this debate. I think the health of youth arts is strong in Scotland, but I do believe that with all the support of the Chamber, all the different agencies, and I'd like to thank Creative Scotland and all the other agencies involved, uh, we can be international leaders in youth arts. And I thank everyone in their support for this motion, and we're more than happy to accept the Labour Amendment. Thank you, that concludes the debate on Time to Shine Youth Arts Strategy. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of a business motion 10036. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10036. Formally moved. Thank you. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10036, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10037, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the Food Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10037. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the motion to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10037, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10038 on the lodging and submission dates for various question times. Moved. The question on this motion will be put decision time to which we now come. There are three questions as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10033.1 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, which seeks to amend motion number 10033 in the name of Fiona Hislop on time to shine youth art strategy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10033, in the name of Fiona Hislop, as amended, on time to shine youth art strategy, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is amended, is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10038, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on lodging and submission dates for various questions, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.